Welcome everybody to the lock in. It's Friday night. My name is Barry Chandler, host of Stories and Sips, host of the lock in, and I'm delighted to be uh, with you again this evening. We're almost a year into our lock ins, believe it or not. It's a year since the bars closed. It's a year since you've been having a chance to get together with your friends and those you like and love together in a bar where you can toast each other in person with whiskey. And we will uh, admit that this uh, virtual lock in that we have here every Friday night is a very poor substitute for meeting in person and looking forward to doing that again very soon. So I'd love to know where you're joining us from tonight. We've got a great, great show tonight. I'm really excited about our guests. I'm really excited about the chat that we're going to have tonight. You see a bottle of Waterford whiskey up here for good reason. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll be joined by the founder of Waterford Distillery, Mark Rainier, who will chat with us about the journey so far and uh, some of the recent developments related to the distillery. Uh, later this evening, we'll be joined by Alex Thibault, who is the National Brand Ambassador for West Cork Distillers, who's going to share another great distilling story from a little bit west down the road in Ireland in West Cork near Skibbereen. So we'll have a good old chat tonight. It'll be a, a good old session. I'm looking forward to the crack uh, and I'd love to know where you are and what you're drinking. Susie is joining us from Columbus. Great stuff. We've got Peter in Texas and we've got um, Glasgow represented. Kieran's on his bike. Placerville, California is represented as well. Very good. Very good. Uh, Columbus, Ohio is representing with uh, Stacy is pouring Waterford Gaia and Samoa's Girl Scout cookies. There's a combination. Great stuff. Uh, let me know if you've got Waterford in your glass, wherever you're joining us from. Um, Ed Powers is joining us. He has a drop of Gaia ready to pour as well. Fantastic. And uh, Chris is joining us from Michigan. He's got Tullamore 12 in the Stories and Sips glass. Fantastic. Um, tonight is going to be a, a fun night. It's going to be a, an entertaining night. We're going to have a great discussion. Uh, as always, we meet here every Friday night to uh, toast our health and each other to, to sip and sample some whiskeys and to meet those responsible for producing the whiskeys. And it's a chance to connect in ways that perhaps we're, we're missing uh, because we can't get together. Uh, the, our first guest tonight, who will be coming on in a few minutes, uh, first came to my attention probably about two and a half years ago. And as I started to get more and more into Irish whiskey and I started to study uh, who was doing what and, and what was happening in Ireland and the resurgence of Irish whiskey in Ireland and the resurgence of the building of new distilleries, uh, Waterford Distillery came uh, across my bow and uh, I was very curious because there was a lot of discussion about this distillery. There was a lot of chatter. There was a lot of uh, spirited debate, let's say, about this distillery. And uh, based in the United States, where, of course, I've been for the last 15 years, uh, I was dying to get to see what was going on in Waterford. And this is not your average distillery by any stretch of the imagination. And many of you will be very familiar with what's happening at Waterford Distillery. But I didn't quite get it and I didn't quite understand what was happening. I didn't quite understand what the fuss was about. They kept talking about this word terroir, didn't know really what that meant when it uh, came to whiskey. Uh, and so to steal a, a phrase from Abraham Lincoln who said, I don't like that man, I should get to know him a bit more. Uh, I made my pilgrimage to Waterford to get to know them a little bit more. And I turned up at the distillery a year and a half ago now, November, I think it was, in uh, 2019, for what I thought was going to be a 45-minute quick show around that turned into six hours at the uh, uh, with, with Ned, the head distiller, and, and Megan, who took me under their wing for six hours, determined to show me exactly what was going on and determined that I would leave there knowing exactly what Waterford Distillery was about. Now, I had plans that day, which were scuppered by Ned and Megan, who uh, refused to allow me to leave until they had driven me from the distillery to the warehouses, taken me to lunch to talk about everything they were doing. It was an amazing day. And I left both bewildered and inspired. And it took me 24 hours to get my head around it and to understand or to organize all of the things that I had learned in my six hours in the distillery. And 24 hours later, I, I went for a, a walk in the woods in Waterford with my dad. And I was still thinking about Waterford Distillery. And as I was walking, I started to piece it all together in my mind. And I had the, my camera in the back of my car. And when we were finished with the walk, I plopped, open the, the, I, I plopped down beside the river, beside the woods, and I turned on my camera. And I just started talking for about 15 minutes straight about what I had learned 24 hours before, about terroir and transparency and traceability. And I got all of my thoughts out uh, and, and onto camera. 
and I, I named that video, which I put up in the, the Stories and Sips YouTube channel, uh, Waterford Distillery, Ireland's Most Exciting Distillery. It was Ireland's most exciting distillery when I visited. It remains to me Ireland's most exciting distillery. Uh, I'm fascinated by what goes on there. It's a distillery not without debate, discussion, detractors, uh, and those who swear by it, and everyone in between. And that's, I think, what makes for great stories, and it's what makes, I think, for a, a great a discussion that we'll have here later on. So uh, Mark Rainier is the man behind the distillery. He is the man that has created this uh, incredible and uh, often mind-blowing, at times mind-blowing process and set of procedures that go into making uh, Waterford whiskey. And no better man to tell us about what's going on there and to talk us through what's been happening over the past few weeks with some of the developments scientifically at Waterford Distillery is the man himself, uh, Mr. Mark Rainier, founder of Waterford Distillery, who we'll bring on right now. Mark, you are very welcome to the lock Good evening, good evening. Good evening. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So it's, and it's what a, a great introduction. I think, I, I think I'll end it there and I'll go. I think that was well, that's it. It was a good night. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> Shortest interview ever. Um, Mark, on, on the back of the inaugural release that came out of the distillery, this is the pilgrimage, mm. your first ever release of whiskey. There's this remarkable mm. quote on the back attributed to you, of course. It says, it started on a Hebridean island when in a previous distilling life, a wonderful Gale, Duncan, told me of the greatest barley he had ever seen. It came from Southern Ireland. And in 2014, a former Guinness brewery situated in the heart of barley country became available. It was an opportunity I couldn't resist. Now, if Morgan Freeman was reading that out, it would be the perfect introduction to a, a Hollywood movie uh, and what was going to happen after that. Um, my question is, you had just, you had built a distillery in Scotland. You had a, a, a exit from a distillery in Scotland to build a very successful mm. whiskey venture. Why bother doing anything in Ireland, despite the fact that Great Barley grew there? Well, uh, well I hadn't finished. It's as simple as that. I hadn't finished what I set out to do. This was at Brooklady, which I, I don't know if you can see it. There's a map behind yeah. me here, uh, um, an Admiralty chart. And so Glasgow is sort of over there. This is the west coast of Scotland. Kintyre is here, that phallic member there. Um, I, 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 um, a, a point aside, just between you and I. Um, back in the 60s, with the, when there was uh, um, a lot of sort of censoring of what could go on uh, TV and what couldn't, and uh, the film boards were, were wondering about, you know, um, the male erection, what, what would be permissible to show and what wouldn't. I mean, how erect does it have to be before it gets banned? And they came up with a, a, a measure to work out the, the degree of flaccidness that was acceptable. And it's called the angle of the dangle. And they based it on Kintyre. <laughs> you see here? That, We're that, starting that, off strong that's tonight. What they, that, <laughs> that's what they used to decide how much erection you could show uh, on the TV. Uh, uh, anyhow, fine. So, so Campbelltown is down here at the knob. Yeah. Uh, um, th this is Isla, Jura, Mull. So Tobermory is up there. Oban up here, uh, the Jura Distillery is there, uh, uh, Ardnahoe, the New Isla Distillery, Bunahaven, Koinila, Ardbeg, Lagavulin, uh, uh, Lefroig, and the new one uh, that Sikinda Singh is building uh, down here at Port Ellen. Port Ellen, obviously, the, the, the now are maltings, but they're going to redo the, 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 the distillery there. And then Beaumont here. Uh, and then you come around the bay and you have Kilhoman over there, Brook Laddie here. And I'm speaking to you from there, from the, the very end. The next stop is America, right here. Uh, um, and of course, Ireland down here, Belfast at the bottom, Dublin a bit further. So if you go literally down that line, that, that uh, um, uh, uh, longitude line, 180 degrees due south, and you come to Waterford. Um, and that was, as you say, the, the great uh, uh, introduction, the memory I had of Duncan McGilvery, who sadly died last year. Um, and so I, I wanted to recognize 
uh, the, him as the chief engineer at Brook and the and the guy who really helped me persuade farmers on Isla to start growing barley again. They hadn't done it since the First World War, when, of course, a lot of these farm lads never came back. Um, so, you know, for the best part of 100 years, there had been no barley grown on Isla. And uh, he helped me persuade very suspicious and reluctant farmers to uh, start growing it again. And it's easy to understand their reluctance. It's a very wild climate up here. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I, I mean, I was looking at some uh, uh, images today uh, um, of uh, land, uh, fields being prepared at Ballygarran. Uh, um, and, you know, they're, they're preparing to sow barley. Well, it's not even March yet. Um, and there's no way you can even get on the ground up here. It's so much wetter. Right. Um, so, so that you can't sow barley here until, till you know, uh, um, April, May. So, you know, it means it gets harvested very late in the year, and then there's the danger of the Atlantic gales flattening it, or the the the, the geese that coming from from Greenland and hoovering it all up, and the deer and everything. So, so it, it, you know, it's a it, it is a difficult place to grow barley. Um, but, uh, you know, 210 miles due south, it's the same latitude as Cambridge. Um, and it's a lot milder climate, the sunny southeast, as you as, as you know. So so you, you, you not only do you have, you know, rich, fertile glacial uh, uh, um, soils, uh, you've got the, you know, the Gulf Stream and the, uh, um, the, 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 the maritime uh, uh, winds coming off the off the Atlantic bringing moisture and rain, you know, it's a very green, you know, it's no wonder, you know, green is the Irish color. It, the whole place is bloody green, you know, it, every, everything very lush and green, great for raising racehorses, uh, dairy cattle and, and growing, growing arable crops. So, so um, I followed the barley. It's as simple as that. I followed the barley um, and Duncan was dead right in 40 years of, his career at Brooklady, the best barley he ever saw, um, came from Ireland, uh, delivered directly to the island. Um, and uh, um, that was, the, the, I suppose, the kernel of the, of the idea of going to Bali, uh, going to, to Ireland, um, to finish off what I'd started at Brooklady, but hadn't been able to finish, which was this idea, this premise that, that, that you know, barley, the source of all the flavor in single malt whiskey you know it's what makes single malt whiskey the most flavorsome spirit in the world um and you know surely the barley there's only three raw ingredients and one of those is water you know um surely um we should be paying more attention to the barley um as it's the source of all the flavor the greatness of whiskey um, so, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science to me. Um, and, yeah. you know, we, we'd shown that, that, that you, you could see differences in the barley grown on different fields. Um, you, we could taste it in the spirit. But at Brookladdy, we didn't have the resources or the logistics or, you know, to be certain, not necessarily the, the actual desire to see it through. Um, you know, it wasn't traditional. It was, you know, all a bit, you know, fancy, a bit puffy. Uh, um, so, so, you know, there was an internal reluctance even. So, 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 you know, I needed to be free to start it, you know, from scratch and do it properly. Um, so the goal, the goal the shared is to create this most flavorful liter of alcohol. And um, you're, you're pouring a drop of flavorful alcohol there. What, what are you pouring? Yeah. Um, I've got here um, a hook head, um, which is um, hook head is a peninsula that sticks out into the southern off the southern Atlantic shore of Ireland. Um, it's about sort of seven or eight miles um, from the distillery, um, and it's a pretty pretty exposed place. You know, it's a, it, it, is, it just thrusts out into the Atlantic. It gets everything. Uh, um, so it's a very wild and crazy place. Um, a very distinctive tower. You know, it's, 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 it's not usual place to be growing barley. 
Um, and so I'm just going to add some water there. And you see that wonderful swirling. I'm going to add quite a lot of water because I, 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 I like a lot of water. Is that how you um, recommend it, water for it is enjoyed? Like, is, is water no, an essential no, no, element? No, no. Oh yes, it is an essential. But you see, see how that separates out. That's yep. natural whiskey. You see, and 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 the and the oils are coming to the surface. That's where all the flavour is. Um, right. And you know, the, the, the whole point of adding water um, to and I, I reiterate, natural whiskey, whiskey that hasn't been chill filtered, um, because chill filtering removes a lot of the uh, um, flavour compounds created during fermentation. To make, in order to make it, you know, very squeaky clean. Um, but if you leave the, if you leave it alone, leave it, you know, natural, um, the water reacts with those flavor compounds to give you more flavor, as well as reacting with the air, oxidizing like it does with wine. Um, so, so, so really, if you buy a, a natural whiskey and don't add water, you're not getting the full story, or certainly not the story that you paid for. Uh, um, so, so I would recommend, and, and how much you add is, you know, purely up to you. A teardrop is the minimum to get that reaction with, with those flavor compounds. Otherwise, it's, you know, add as much as you want because you're not going to dilute the flavor at all. You're going to dilute the alcohol, but not the flavor. Now, mm. if you do this with a commercial standard whiskey, you dilute everything. So it doesn't really work the same way. And certainly a very dark, you know, you know, whiskey. Again, you'll 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 break everything if you if you add water uh, or, or too much water. But natural whiskey doesn't matter. Uh, um, and certainly here on Isla, you know, that's how I learned to drink whiskey the the Isla way, which is very different to how I imagined, which was you know the armchair far side, you know, thing, you know. Um, up here, it's in the kitchen, standing up, you know, with a howling gale outside. Um, and, you know, it's probably midday. You know, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it, you know, they drink whiskey instead of tea. Uh, um, so, so in order not to get shit faced, uh, um, you know, you add lots and lots of water because I'm not quite, you know, the stature of some of these big Viking like farmers that, that, that we have here. Well, um, well, cheers. So, so, take a little well, sip cheers, of this. Yeah. I'm drinking Dundalia Slancha. Cheers. Thanks for joining. Oh, see, that, see, this is the thing. You, you don't actually even need to drink it. You can just smell it. That, that's yeah, that's but, the fun. And then watch it, how, how it evolves and how it changes in the glass. That's, that's, the, that's the excitement to me. You know, you've got the most flavorsome spirit, single malt whiskey. Give it a chance to perform. Uh, uh, let, let it, it's like the dance of the seven veils. It's like a strip tease. You know, you know, layer by layer is being revealed as it warms up, as it oxidizes, as it reacts with that water. So, so enjoy the strip teas. Don't be too, don't be too hasty. Because you're starting off strong tonight from the the angle of dangles. <laughs> <to the strip laughs> well, what's next? Should we put you on a okay, five yeah. second delay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, there's lots of questions coming in. I'm going to, I, I just want to let everyone know that I see the questions. I'm going to put as many to Mark as he's willing to get through tonight. Uh, and that doesn't matter uh, how objective, subjective, uh, complimentary or otherwise Anything the questions goes. are, bring them all in, bring them all in. And we'll, I assure Anything you, goes. I am not filtering any of these. We'll put as many up as we possibly can. Um, mm. Mark, early on, right, right from the outset, you faced pushback to this approach in Waterford. Mm. Um, First of all, could you elaborate on when I say the approach? Because this is a different approach to whiskey making, as you've articulated. I think you've shared that you, you're not saying it's the only way, the best way in the world. It's your way, and you're doing it differently. What are you doing, and why has there been pushback? Uh, that's quite a big, uh, um, big subject. Uh, um, well, first of all. Um, I, 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 you know, as you know, I, I come from the, the a wine background. You know, my family was involved in wine, um, and I spent my first twenty years, um, particularly in the Burgundy vineyards. Um, that you know, that was nineteen eighty onwards, and the eighties and nineties was a big period of. Uh, um, it was a renaissance for the French vineyards and the European vineyards. 
Um, it's where they, they learned to make wine properly, the modern way. And they learned it from California and they learned it from, from, from Australia, the science of wine. It was no longer folklore. It was no longer, you know, a mystique, you know, a tradition. You know, here was the science. This is what you need to do. You need, you know, a, a stainless steel. You need pneumatic pumps. You need a, a, a canopy management. You need uh, um, the right clones. You need uh, um, to understand the, the, the impact with the wood and how much new wood and how much, you know, sort of uh, um, the wine can support. Uh, um, you know, you know it, it was, they, they'd lost the idea of terroir. Um, and, and, and they were trying to rediscover it because that's what they got, which was really special. Anybody can grow Pinot Noir, but, you know, Burgundy, they, they had this terroir identified you know since the middle ages by monks and uh, cistercian monks um observing that in specific parts of this hillside um the grapes grow differently some um you know little bowls get hotter in the sun in in in, in you know in the in, in, they ripen earlier sometimes they over ripen and they and they almost get burnt uh, um, some are, are uh, on clay soils and some are on sandier soils, uh, and that gives a different flavor. You know, some of them are on the wrong slope, they're facing north, and so they don't get as much, you know, a, a heat. Uh, some are on very white, you know, limestone, you know, so it refracts, uh, it reflects the, the, the temperature back during, during the night. Uh, uh, um, all of these things that, that these monks observed changed altered the character of the grapes when they harvested them some would harvest earlier some would harvest later uh, some would have higher acidity some lower and so when they then vinified them and made wine the, you know the wines were different um, and of course uh, over the years over the centuries the market picked up those differences so for example Romani Conti is a thousand pounds a bottle but the other side of the wall, uh, the, the, the wine's a hundred pounds a bottle, and the other side of that wall, and the wine's ten pounds a bottle. You know, so so th this idea of terroir was very much uh, what these uh, third generation post-war winemakers were rediscovering after you know a, a sort of 30, 40 years of sort of cooperative winemaking where you know no one was making any money the landowners said right i'm not doing this it could all, all go to a co-op get bundled in together it's all about yields 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 the more grapes you bring the more money you get um and so you know the, the, the idea of terroir went out the window just as the land owner went the other way um and so it, it was the 80s that this third generation said well you know we can do you know we can we can do better than this. And they came back, took back from their tenants, the, 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 the vineyards, um, educated themselves in modern winemaking and uh, um, set about basically reducing yields by almost a third um, to rediscover, you know, what's under, uh, you know, what's going on. Um, and so I was there, you know, the, 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 the organic movement, the biodynamic movement, uh, um, all these, these uh, different avenues were being explored and it was riveting. And so I very much, you know, you know, uh, um, was inspired by that. And so when, when I got interested in whiskey, uh, um, which had its naissance, single malt whiskey had a naissance, not a renaissance, a naissance. At the same time, 80, 82, 83, um, during the oil crisis, when um, uh, a lot of the stockholders of, of bulk whiskey, of, of you know, the barrels of, uh, of single malt, realized they needed, you know, for economic reasons, to rebalance their stockholdings. And so sold off um, very cheaply um, stocks of barrels of whiskey from distilleries that they'd shut down a decade earlier in the previous oil crisis. Um, and so all of a sudden, there were these barrels of really old whiskey back from the 60s, from distilleries that no longer existed, 
um, that you could buy if you're clever enough um, and bottle up and produce and, and say, look, here you go. This is, this is, this is like, you know, the crown jewels. And so, you know, at the time, you've got to remember single malt whiskey accounted for barely 0.1% of all whiskey. It was nothing. There was Macallan, there was uh, Glenfiddich, you know, there, there was hardly anything else. Um, it was all going into blended whiskey. It was providing the whiskey essence for column still grain whiskey. Um, and so there was this sudden burgeoning of the single malt whiskey. It, 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 it just came out of, out of nowhere. Um, and so these two movements going on at the same time and, you know, I basically decided to put them together, um, seeing that, you know, these old barrels were all disappearing and there was going to be none left. Um, I thought about, you know, wouldn't it be fun to make my own? And surely I remember, I remember thinking, surely I could do a better job. Um, that was the arrogance that, 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 that you know, I threw at it and, and, uh, you know, it's a long story, but eventually I got the chance to buy, yeah. um, the closed down Brooklady distillery and renovate it um, and get it going again. Um, but you know, that that's, I can't even remember what the question is. What was the question? So <laughs> what, the, did you ask me? That's a great layup for what you're now doing at Waterford in the mm. sense of you've had this origin, this, this is the origin yeah. story of you I were remember inspired, now. I remember, you got your yeah. insights your and now was, that you're at, well, now that you're at Waterford. Was, 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 yeah, but your question, I just remembered, your question was why, you know, what did people think of this? Uh, um, and it's that's, You're getting that's pushback, like you're getting, point. yeah, you're, you're getting yeah, debate yeah, and... and yeah. Uh, well, it, well, it wasn't debate, it was you're a bleeding NASA. What the hell are you doing? Uh, uh, um, you know, this isn't, you know, from the Scottish side, it was, well, this isn't how a distillery is run. This isn't, you know, even my own team was saying, no, no, you, we can't do that. You know, who, you know, you know I... The thing is, everything I was wrong, the wrong person. I'm not in a kilt. I don't sound Scottish. Um, I was living in London. Um, I've got a French name. Um, I'm from the wine trade. You know, who the hell are you telling us how to make whiskey? Um, and I said, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling anybody. This is what I want to do. Uh, now, the fact yeah. is, the, the fact that I'm half Scottish anyhow, uh, my mother, my grandfather, uh, um, you know, th 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 that didn't count because I don't sound Scottish, so therefore I can't be Scottish. Uh, um, you know, it, it, you know that, that's, you know, the wrong yeah. religion, the wrong everything, you know. Um, so, so, so there's a lot of cultural resistance, uh, um, private school, not public school, and, and, and you know, it, it, who, the, who the hell are you? Um, so, so there was that, that cultural difference. Um, should we put it that way, uh, yeah. uh, politely? Um, and then from the industry itself, um, well, it, like, it was like stirring up a hornet's nest. You know, you're an outsider coming along uh, uh, um, and you're know, trying these new fancy ideas. You know, you know how dare you? Um, and of course, by consequence, it sort of asked questions what everybody else did. Um, I didn't ask them. You know, other people do. Uh, um, it's not my fault. So, so you know, the first thing was transparency. We wanted people to see what happens. And in Brook Abbey, we're using sort of 19th century, the original 19th century equipment. Well, how do you believe me? Well, I have to show you. Because remember, you know, the whiskey industry, the drinks industry is inordinately powerful. It's immensely concentrated. In Ireland, you know, 80% of, of whiskey is made by one company. You know, 20 years ago, it was 100% by one company. In Scotland, 60% is made by two companies. You know, you know so, 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 you know, there's a huge concentration of power. And, of course, the modus operandi, the reason they got so big in the first place was that 19th century marketing of, you know, the blended whiskies, which were basically limitless in volume instead of a single poxy uh single malt distillery you could make as much as you want cheap as chips add the single malts to give it some whiskey you know flavor and away you go you then spend all your money on telling people to buy it big you know advertising 
And that's how, you know, the Dewars and the Johnny Walkers and the Black and White and the Buchanans and the Grouse and all, you know, that's how they got so big. It was marvelous, amazingly successful. Uh, um, but the whole, you know, the bit you're missing there, you know, obviously is, it wasn't the single malt distilleries they were promoting. They were hidden away. Um, so, so even when I was doing Brooklady, you know, th those other Isla distilleries, the majority of what they are distilling is destined for blended whiskey. You, you know, don't forget that. They, 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 were, they were basically factories to produce the components for blended whiskey. Okay, the, the proportions perhaps have changed as, as single malt whiskeys become more, more, more recognized. Yes. But, you know, and, and of course, they don't really like that being pointed out. And, and so, you know, we wanted people to come to the distillery. We wanted to open the doors, come on in, have a look, see how it's done, um, which was an anathema at the time. You weren't even allowed to visit distilleries back right. then. You know, the doors were shut. Uh, it was all behind, you know, oh, no, 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 nothing to see here. And we said the Mark, opposite. Come and have a look. Do you think that when, when you arrived in Ireland, whatever about the, to, to quote you, the, the lack of pedigree in the whiskey world you had in Scotland, you, you had even less in the Irish whiskey world because you didn't even have half of your, you're not even half Irish or a quarter mm. Irish, are you? And, 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 <laughs> I, and, yes, and, yeah. I'm married think to that, an Irish woman. <laughs> Oh, well, okay. Well, that, that, that's a plus for you. That, that'll earn you some brownie points. Um, but do you think that the Irish took you as telling the Irish whiskey industry how to do it better and that you oh, oh, knew better doubt. than them? But, 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 but it's the same. The, you, you sort of seen the same theme running here. Who are you? Uh, um, and what are you telling us to do? You know, where have we heard that sort of before? You know, I'm not telling anybody what to do. You know, I don't want to know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. So to leave me alone, let me get on with it. You know, so, so, you know, I don't engage. I didn't engage with the Scotch Whiskey Association because they don't represent my interests. In fact, they do the opposite. You know, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a body set up by, you know, the, 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 as a regulatory industry, you know, body, but it's actually a lobbying body for the whole British drinks trade. In Ireland, so the, the IWA, well, this, po th this point about you wanting to be left alone and doing your thing is, th th it, 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 share, it, it reminds me of, there's a story to Waterford that keeps getting lost. And I can't for the life of me work out why. Uh, maybe it's because we're, we live in a world of uh, convenient sound bites and easy armchair yeah. arguments where we can yeah. debate and dispute without needing the nuance of detail. But... Correct. What I've always taken away, and, and we've had some conversations for the podcast, and I'm hoping we'll have some more, but what I've always taken away is you're this man who is coming in from the outside, has looked at it and said, yeah, okay, I have another idea. I want to apply it here. I have beliefs. I'm bringing my own money to the table, and I'm getting investors to, to pony up as well. We're going to do a thing. We're not telling you it's the best way. We're telling you it's our way, and we actually have – we think we're doing a good thing. Yet the argument and the conversation keeps getting pulled back to this scientific topic of terroir, seemingly. So your <laughs> yeah. approach gets lost. Like, it's, isn't it like this one man's vision for a more flavorful well, liter of alcohol is lost? Uh, well, I, th I think it, 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 a couple of things you've raised there, a couple of points there, is, 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 you know, when you've got a monopoly, no one likes someone else coming along and, and, and saying, you know, there's another way of doing things. Nobody likes that. It's understandable. Uh, um, so, so you know, and remember, Ireland was a monopoly for 25 years. It was a duopoly for the previous 50 or whatever it is. You know, that's not healthy. You know, and of course, add to that as a consequence. If you mention to anybody Irish whiskey, they say Jameson's. Jameson's is Irish whiskey. Irish whiskey is Jameson's. Well, th they don't do single malt whiskey. Uh, um, you know, so, so, so give me a break. Uh, um, but of course, you know, if, if people are suddenly not talking about you anymore, they're suddenly talking about the new boy on the block, they don't like that. It's understandable. And remember the power. Remember the power, the advertising power, the, the ability to control the debate 
Um, I mean, we had a, a, um, a fantastic uh, um, article, um, our, our terroir proving study, um, which you know, I tell you more about. Um, and that, yeah, and that came out last week. And it was almost a full page in the Times. Uh, it was in the, uh, um, uh, the Express, the Daily Mail, uh, uh, um, the Sun, it, it, all these things. Um, fantastic, brilliant, really pleased. You know, out, out there for the first time it was, was, was our terroir project. But the funny thing was, it wasn't in the drinks articles. Not a single drinks journalist wanted to know not one and that so is the scary thing and the reason for that hold on a second, the reason for that yeah. the reason drinks journalists don't want to know is because they know they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them so anything controversial anything that might be construed as a threat to some of their major advertisers they aren't going to engage with add to that also the laziness of, of a lot of those people you know that's it's press release material okay i'll, I'll I, I, you know as it goes you know the, 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 the actual sort of lack of knowledge they're 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 they're, 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 they're presenting themselves as experts but they're not uh um you know they're the guys that get wined and dined and taken around to all these castles and hotels and and looked after royally and everything but some upstart like us, we can't do that. We can't afford that. So, so, so they know which side their let, bread's let, buttered. Let, let's take a step back. So let's ignore right. the industry for a second. And if we're to take you at your word, and I have no reason to doubt you, if you're saying that the consumer, you want the end, the whiskey drinker to have the most flavorful liter of alcohol, you believe that that's uh, going to originate with the barley and that where it's grown will impact uh, how it eventually tastes. We'll get into yeah. more detail on that in a second. There's lots of quite uh, impassioned uh, pleas about uh, and arguments in the comments right now. But your argument is that if you can produce your whiskey this way, the consumer will have access to whiskey that is produced in a way that you believe gives a more flavorful liter of alcohol. And over time, as the whiskey gets older and older and older, there will be more opportunities to taste more mature, more complex whiskeys that have been created yeah. your way. Um, yeah. Why, I'm not saying it's why, the only way. It's my so way. Why is there so but, much but, I mean, pushback from consumers on that? Do you think, like even the consumer side of things? Well, perhaps because it's you know. Well, I, I think you you again you, you know it's it's uh, you get this. It's like Rangers and Celtic. Uh, um, you end up with with uh, um, affiliations. Um, you know, whiskey mm. is not like wine in that. You know, there's five thousand chateaus in bordeaux you know there's 130 distilleries in scotland there's 30 in ireland you know it's a very very different ball game on that basis so it doesn't take much to be an expert in whiskey i mean just think about it you know uh, um 5, in bordeaux alone versus you know yes. you know 130 and you know so, so or if you take Scotland and Ireland together, uh, uh, 160, say, or say, say 200, you know, but yeah, you, know, yeah. you get the idea of the quantum. Um, so, so, so I think it's people have their um, uh, affiliation, like their football team. Um, they are marketed to, to follow their football team. Um, and they carry on doing it. Um, and so when somebody else comes along and says, actually, I'm a new team and, and this is what I'm doing. And, and, and people go, wow, that's amazing. And, like, Ooh, that, uh, and then they go, well, I'm not playing, you know, uh, uh, give me my ball. I'm going off over here. Uh, um, and so you do, you, you end up with that sort of preparatorial thing where how dare you upset what I know? You know, I've been told that this, this and this, and you're telling me X, Y and Z. So, you know, oh, no, you know. Well, fine, fine. Carry on doing what you're doing. You know, I'm not, I'm not pressing you to, to, to come to Waterford. For God's sake, no. That you know, <laughs> this is, you know, undoubtedly, uh, um, uh, uh, um, how should we put it? This, it, this is uh, uh, for people that are curious of mine, people that want to know 
what really happens and we'll show you we this is not for everybody you know it, you know there is plenty 99% of whiskey out there you know which you just carry on doing your thing i'm not taking you away from that i you know carry on doing what you're doing if on the other hand you want to know a bit more if you want to get to understand if you want to look under the bonnet and see what really is going on well then come with us because we're having a really good time finding out and sharing was, it with everybody i was under the impression our Mark, that you were forcing and our failures well i thought that you were forcing everyone to buy waterford that's my understanding that mm. when you wake up in the morning you were mandated yes. to spend your 70 yeah, euros yes, on your own drink. <laughs> drink. <laughs> drink well let, drink so <laughs> let's um and look i i agree with you and i don't i think there, there's a big i get i'm surprised to see so many people in the irish whiskey world assume that all whiskies are for all people even at different price points we must have them all if they're not if i can't get them i'm going to shake my fist i would agree with you this is not a whiskey for everybody i'm fascinated by the process and the approach um the single farm growing of the barley the malting it individually yeah. Brewing, yeah. brewing fermenting individually distilling yeah. your paper that came out the scientific paper there will be detractors that no matter what happens will argue that <laughs> well so first of all, terroir doesn't exist is the first argument. Then even if terroir exists, it's going to be ruined mm. it's through the malting yeah, process. Yeah, yeah. Oh, ruined, yeah, then yeah. distilling, then maturation. And you paid for the study, therefore it's going to be biased towards Waterford, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. yeah. So what? So this study, does this put an end to the what I would consider the distracting conversation of a thing we all know that if a strawberry grows in Wexford, it's different than a strawberry that grows in Listowel in County Kerry. That's something that surely we all know. Does this study mm. put an end to that portion of it or does it continue now? Well, you just said it. That's terror, what you're talking about there with yeah. strawberries. I mean, I mean you know, there is nothing weird or wonderful about terror. It's called gardening, for God's sake. You know, that's what the gardeners understand intrinsically that, you know, if you want to plant camellias or azaleas or fuchsias, there's no point trying to plant them in a sandy soil or a rich loam soil because they'll die. They need an acidic soil. Right. Um, you know, every, your mother knows that, you know, a rose will not grow on a north facing wall. It needs to be on the south. To get that you know to get all the sun you know everybody knows you don't go and plant your finest trees in a bog you know you know because they won't grow you know everybody knows you don't plant uh, you know trees on top of a hill because they'll they'll, they'll never get above the ground because of the wind you know these are such basic elements that everybody who doesn't perhaps live in the city knows uh, um and it's the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the problem here is again it, it, it's passion it's this word terroir it sounds elitist it sounds french it sounds ooh fancy um and you know ooh, I, you know I, I i i don't want to know anything more about this you know I'm, i know what i like and i'll stick to that well fine you know but terroir all it is is a, a french word that, and and this is where the problem lies there is no direct English translation of it. That's, that is the problem. And I've yeah. looked and I've looked and I've looked and there isn't one. So, so let's, let's just knock that on the head. What is terroir? Is it a distillery? Is it uh, um, a person? Is it a, a whiskey making policy? No, it's none of those things. Not at all. Absolutely no. It's about the interaction of microclimate, soil, um, altitude, yeah. orientation, uh, um, subsoil, bedrock, all of these things on influencing how a plant grows. It's as simple as that. It's got nothing to do with what you do once the plant's grown. 
It's how that plant grows, the, the factors that impact on how it grows. So, you know, basically put, if you stick um, an apple tree in the Sahara Desert, it ain't going to grow. You are not going to get any apples. Uh, um, that's, you know, more or less, you know, what, so, the, the, what, we're, what we're getting at. Yeah. So, so, so terwa is, 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 is how the plant grows. We know it best through the vine for winemaking, but it's right. the vine, not the winemaking. So it's how that plant grows, therefore how its fruit grows. Um, so uh, um, if you take a, 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 a very poor summer, uh, it takes a long time for that fruit to, to ripen properly. The acids, the tannins, um, are at different levels and you get sort of harsh, bitter, tannic wine if it's very cold and wet and you know, longer. It's the same with barley. You know, it's the same with any other fruit, um, except, it, you know, with barley, uh, the roots aren't as deep, you know, it's two meters instead of, you know, 10. Uh, yeah. um, it's not a big berry, it's a, it's a grain um, and it's not sugar it's it's uh, starch and this is where the you know the get out of jail for the for the for the doom mongers is that to get to the sugar um you have to malt the barley which is uh, um basically replicating uh germination replicating right. spring really so so the you know you 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 you, you add water to it um it goes oh it's springtime um, so now that starch, we're going to turn it into sugars to provide the energy to grow a root and to grow a, a um, you know a plant. And, and so a series of enzymes are triggered uh, to convert the starch into sugar. And it's that sugar or wort when it's you know, with, with the water um, that we can ferment. And that's the only difference, really, because then you, you know you know grape juice. Um, will produce an alcohol uh, while it's fermented of you know anyway you know, ten to fourteen percent, um, and wort will produce an alcohol of anywhere between eight and ten percent, right? And that's fermentation. Um, and then the difference is, and, and of course, fermentation is where you liberate all the flavors. Everybody, and this is another sort of marketing trick that's been you know blazoned away on everybody on uh, you know, in, in this sort of really facile way which is it's all about the distilling and distilling is the magic the mystery of of whiskey no it isn't it's chemistry it always has been back to when they first invented it in 800 a.d in syria of all places so right? the, the whiskey it's terroir chemistry. project when when it released its results, when you released the results last week, what it had independently proven, let's um, and I'm ready for the debate on those words, even in the comments now. But the what what has been shown is that the post distillation spirit, the distillate, the new make spirit, we have samples here, for example, I've got two new make spirits here, um, that there exists within that new make spirit. So post this catastrophic process of distillation yeah, yeah, this yeah. Um, destructive process that thermodynamics even the laws of thermodynamics show us that distillation doesn't kill flavor and now this study has shown the same that the flavor variants still exist post distillation so let's say we take all that as being okay well that puts that to bed now we're left with until we find a new Wait. thing to detract from the the maturation piece so now we put this whiskey this spirit goes into the wood and eventually it'll come, it'll yeah, become you, this color. Yeah, but you're jumping the gun. You're jumping Go the on. gun because people won't even accept that, that you know, some people, the, the people that don't want to know, they don't want to accept, you know, yeah. so they're looking for every possible reason to, to, you know, the reason I did the terroir project in the first place was because at Brook Gladdy, there was a, a, a major industry player who, um, went around saying, or quoting, quoting uh, um, a, a 16th century drinking song, 
English drinking song called John Barleycorn. You can look it up. And it's basically a, you know, a, a sing-along song with your, with your pints of beer, um, telling the story of poor old John Barleycorn sort of growing in the fields in the pouring rain and the sweltering sun, and then he's cut down and then he's mashed and he's milled and, and then he's you know, boiled up. And you know, it, it's a sort of Dante Inferno-esque sort of story. Uh, of course, it never actually even gets to distilling, by the way. Uh, it only gets as far as the, the yeah. brewing stage. Um, and, and so this, this, this industry uh, eminent uh, person was we, we saying, well, no, no, look, you know, terroir can't possibly exist you know, because we do too many nasty things to it. Um, and there's no scientific evidence to prove that terroir exists anyhow. Now, that last point he was right yeah there isn't any or wasn't any but there is now uh um, and so i set out to prove to these people particularly that terroir like we all know we can all taste it with ourselves you know it, you know it's not like you're, you're sort of inventing something that you know uh, um has never been there we can all taste it we can all nose it in the spirit uh, um, we all, you know, it's, it's, it's been there. It's why we buy this wine or that wine or whatever. Um, and so I um, asked the Irish Ministry of Agriculture, their department called uh, Chagas, um, that I wanted to do a project to prove this. And they said, well, this is a very interesting idea. We've got a brand new piece of kit uh, um, that might help. But the inspiration came from America. The inspiration came, and the answers to two of your, your points here, came from America. Um, I read a study uh, written by Dr. Dustin Herb of Oregon State University, um, who was working at the time for a, fee, uh, um, a, a seed merchant. And uh, um, he was looking at uh, uh, a different aspect. But I, I, in his paper, I read um, his methodology and it became clear that in reaching his uh, assumptions, he'd passed through the stage of proving that terroir existed in Oregon. So I got in touch with him. I said, look, let, let's let's do this. You know, let's do this project. And he said, yeah, great, I'd love to do it. So we got him to analyze the data and to provide the methodology. Um, we got the Irish government uh, uh, agricultural department to provide the machinery. A, a, a gas chromatography mass spectron olfactometer try saying that when you've had a few yeah. um we got and then you know just to make sure you know there, there's no possible sort of you know we got the leading independent scottish whiskey laboratory to and now this is the point here we needed to make sure that this was not our whiskey it was neutral whiskey with no ulterior influences whatsoever. So we, uh, um, our maltsters grew the barley on two different sites. Um, they micro malted it in the laboratory uniformly. There were 36 samples from two different sites, okay? Just to cover the, you know, the whole spectrum. They were then Mic uh, laboratory micro fermented, mi or micro milled, micro fermented, and micro distilled in the laboratory in Scotland. All right. So we ended up with spirits um, that were laboratory based, laboratory made, but you know with barley from 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 Ireland. So there was no external influence there were no external processes or anything like that it was done uniformly 36 samples uh, and what's that 18 from 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 each each side and then they were uh, sensory analyzed in scotland so not Ireland, scotland and then they were sent to chagas in in ireland where they went under mass spectrum gas chromatography olfactometry um, which is the latest version, which allows you to not only analyze technically what the flavor compounds are 
in the spirit. But it also, and this is a new bit, allows you to sensorily analyze or, or, or experience what those flavors are as they are um, released. So you can match not only a, a, a spike on a graph to the actual smell that it is. So this is the first time we can do this. You can see now there were over 2000 flavor, flavor compounds identified. Over 2000. Most of those, you know, minuscule. The major flavor compounds were 42. 10 of which didn't even have a name. All right. So it's mm. those 42 that we focused on. Um, and, you know, so there's a whole load behind that, you know, the, 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 the minimal, the minimal threshold level that we, that, that, that we didn't analyze, you couldn't analyze those 42. And of those 42, just over 50% of them were influenced by the terroir. So just under, you know, 48% weren't but 52 were all right that's science you cannot argue with that it has been done because i knew full well that everybody said oh well you you didn't do this you didn't do that oh and you know i knew this because that's the cynicism that goes with this you know when you're dealing with these uh the, you know the naysayers the, you know the, the flat earthers you know uh, so let's uh, take um, this to so more let's take these results as so what I'm seeing in terms of the, and I've never heard of it, I've, I've never seen a distillery and a whiskey so disputed, debated, discussed. <laughs> and if I'm, if I'm sick of it, you're sick of it, right? I'm sure uh, hearing some of these comments. I did listen to it. Well, what I'm seeing now is up until you had this study, what you just had were detractors or naysayers and those who were complimentary and who, who engaged and who embraced. Now what you've got is you've got this, you've got two camps that you've been able to divide people up into those who, don't believe the science, don't believe the facts, and those who don't think that it matters to their whiskey consumption, which is fine. Like It seemed like there wasn't, fine. up until now, the opportunity fine. to divide the audience into, well, fine. you can't just say it's but, terrible. But, 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 but no, but you're still going to get people that just don't want to know. Don't tell me, see no evil, hear no evil, you know, just leave me alone. Don't upset you know what I know. I know what I you know. I don't need any of these you know ideas. You know, I just want to drink the stuff day in day out that I've always drunk. You know, leave me alone. Fine. You know, don't bother me. G go away. It doesn't mean I can't do. Or does it that I can't do what we're doing? You know, it's astonishing. Now a lot of this, you know, is is and of course, you know, I said this is for people that. Come with us if you're interested. If you're not, leave me alone. Go away. You know, I'm not bothering you. You don't bother me. Live and let live. But you've got this brooding sort of industry, uh, um, you know, stirring the shit. You know, uh, uh, you know, trying to sort of oh yeah, you know, that 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 Renier fellow. Oh, I don't like the cut of his jib. You know, all this sort of stuff. Well, you don't have to like me. You know, I'm not asking to be liked like most of the whiskey industry is, you know, this propping up the bar, you know, hell fellow well met, you know, oh, you know, aren't we all really nice people? Aren't we really friendly and everything? Well, so behind the scene, they're all stabbing everybody in the back. You know, you know, th that duplicity. I've yeah. got no yeah. time for the duplicity. You know, I may say I'm telling you what I'm seeing. You don't have to listen. I'm not evangelizing. You know, I'm explaining what I'm doing. Leave me alone. Let me get so, on with it. Uh, so let's before we leave you alone. Uh, and I think I I I, I <laughs> like nothing better than a, a a firm stake in the ground. Here's my position. Here's my belief. Like it or love it. I'm doing my thing. It takes it takes uh, you putting your money where your mouth is and doing it. And, and it's not at anybody yeah. else's cost that you're doing it. But here, so let what frustrates me no end about the discussions. Uh, as they go on tangents about Waterford Distillery and whiskey, is that the story that's getting lost is that irrespective of where you came from and what people think you're telling people or are not, is that there's a story here of Irish grain, Irish barley being distilled the in, in the world and being called the best in the world by a non-Irish person who is saying, you make the best barley, I'm going to make the what I consider... Uh, mm. 
the best whiskey with it, and I'm going to make it available I to can. you at your choice. It's your choice, free market capitalism, to buy it if you'd like. Uh, or if you don't like, fine, just please move on. But what we've got a remarkable story here is there are not many distilleries that have the complete Irish loop of growing, malting, fermenting, distilling, bottling, selling. You've got it all there where you're hearing the farmers, you're hearing the maltsters, you're hearing everybody along the way. And nobody in the whiskey world can have avoided or ignored the quantity of content, be it video, article, et cetera, that's being produced by the distillery to showcase the most important people. So my question to the audience who are, I mean, there are some venomous comments I'm not even going to engage with now because sure. they're ridiculous. I'm sure. Um, it's just ridiculous because how can we not be proud of that approach? And if we're not proud of that approach, are we saying we care nothing for these wonderful videos of pale-faced, freckly farm farm children yeah. standing at the wheel of a tractor, proud of their dad who grew barley that now ends up in a bottle with his farm's name in it? I'm, I just, I can't understand it. I can't understand it. But, 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 well, you know, welcome. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> but welcome to what happens when you put your head above the parapet, which is precisely why people don't put their heads above the parapet you know, which is why journalists won't put their heads above the parapet you know you know it, 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 fine uh, um i don't read these things deliberately at all because you know it, it would just be too depressing for words uh, uh, um but for goodness sake what do those people do what what do you make you know what? What, yeah. what have you uh, uh, done for the economy and for people and, 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 and to move the thing forward? You know, when you've done something, then you have the right to criticise me, but not now. Not if you haven't. And yeah. so, a lot of these keyboard warriors, we get a lot of them in Scotland. They sit there. They've had too many yeah. of these, and they and they fire away. They're saying, "Oh, you know, nationalist thing." You know, uh, you know. Uh, um, well, you know, hey, we've got to live, uh, um, and I do. So we're not smoke and mirrors. We're not pretending. We're not saying one thing and doing the other. You know, the collars and the cuffs match. Uh, um, and until yeah. anybody else does this, you know, then, then, then give me a break. Uh, uh, um, you mentioned the thing about farmers. You know, this is a very interesting point. We first saw this in Ireland, in, in Scotland, Ireland. You know, that when you had, and, and, and this is when I knew we were onto something, when we had, you know, the spirit of the uh, um, specific farms and uh, the farmer there, we let them taste this spirit. And, you know, these big, you know, farmers were sort of nosing and going, oh, yes, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and then nosing the other guys, you know, oh, oh, oh I don't like yours. Uh, um, and then one of the farmers would say, well, oh, hold on a second. You know, I saw you sow your seed. We, we sowed our seed on the same day, the same variety. How come these are tasting different, even in the new spirit? Well, because that's where all the flavor compounds are in the new spirit. Um, and you got them to rationalize. You, you overheard them rationalizing. Why? Ah oh, well, you know, you you're closer to the shore there. You you got more sand where you are. You know, I'm further higher up there. I've got more, you know, more more alluvial soil and you know more peat and everything. That must be what it is, you know. Uh, um, and of course, it's this interest. Uh, it, you know, are we finding it difficult to find farmers that want to be involved? No. Um, the age of the farmers has come right down uh, over the last five years. Uh, um, as the younger farmers who see what we're doing go, hey, I want to be involved in that. Um, and the pride that they have, you know, their grain, their, the, the fruit of their labor, instead of it just being taken away and they never see it again, you know, they're seeing it again. They're seeing it, their name, you know, their, their work, their effort, the pride 100%. they have. For finally actually say, say, well, look, I, I got involved. I, I made that happen. You know, uh, um, what's wrong with that? What, I, I um, couldn't uh, agree more. I couldn't agree more. And when we were, when we were, you know, we were producing the stories and Sips is helping produce the podcast for Waterford at the moment. And, uh, you know, kindly Waterford Distillery has given us full, me full, complete editorial control over what we put out there. But what we've done over the past few weeks is I've been, the past few months, I've been talking with farmers 
And I have left some of my conversations with farmers close to tears because of the pride when they talk about their family's uh, name being used, their family's farm name being used. And uh, it, it is hard not to ignore the begrudgery that exists. And uh, I haven't lived in Ireland now for 15 years, and I still uh, experience the Irish begrudgery even overseas. But uh, Michael Mullen put up a comment here that has to be highlighted. Uh, Mark is shouting about our whiskey, investing in Irish jobs, and the industry should be congratulated, not shot down. I cannot understand. I cannot for one second accept uh, uneducated, uninformed arguments against a process that is being deployed by a man and his team who've put their own money into a what would have been a mothballed brewery uh, to turn it into a distillery that is creating something that is true to his own vision. And honestly, I have never seen such vitriol. But what we should be celebrating here is that we have barley in from Irish fields ending up in Irish yeah. glasses to Irish jobs. It's yes. this is the thing to be celebrated. But look but over why? my shoulder. But why is there the vitriol? Look, why look at the bottle over my shoulder. I've got red breast, yeah. I've got Waterford. I love these whiskeys yeah. for their own reasons. These are not whiskeys that can be compared alongside one another. They're unique for their own special approach. And I, I, if people think that you should be comparing a 70 euro, three year old or four year old whiskey alongside another that's 12 years old, you're missing the point. You're missing the point completely. And you're missing the efficiencies that are deployed by a company that has 80% okay. of the market. That, that, that's an interesting point you raised there, which, which is the price. Uh, um, uh, two points. One is that uh, um, clearly I'm not Irish. I don't sound it. Uh, um, I don't, you know, o o Rainier is, is, is not my name. Uh, um, fine. So there's going to be, you know, who the hell are you, uh, you know, sort of thing. That, that's fair enough. Uh, um, and then, you know, uh, um, 70 euros. Right. Okay. How do we, you know, what, why? You know, you know it, we wanted to share these single farm you know you've got to remember this is not the end goal this is this is merely a stepping stone right these single farm origins are a stepping stone we haven't even got to the main picture yet the, 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 these are just the, the you know the, the advertising for we haven't got to the main uh film um we pay a premium for for, for barley of course we have to um, we have our own logistics. We have to, a, a huge uh, uh, entrepot that we built to take the barley in each of those single farm units, 40 a year. Uh, it doesn't happen you know, you know, just like that. It has to be put in place. Um, the barley, uh, um, by the time we get it at the distillery, is double the price um, that it is off the field. Uh, the, the malting process, the transport, the shipping and everything. Um, you know, we don't have the luxury of uh, benefits of scale because we're a standalone distillery. We're not buying hundreds of thousands of tons from the Ukraine. We haven't chosen to buy the cheapest barley um, in the world. Now, this is a very interesting point because a lot of the uh, uh, development in uh, 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 promoting um, since the six, the late, you know, the early seventies, uh, um, um, propagating barley, the primary raw ingredient, remember, um, has been based on increasing the yields in the field, which is now three times what it was back in the fifties. Um, the increasing the yields of alcohol per ton increasing the disease resistance, um, reducing the height to prevent wind damage, and, in my view, slightly more sinisterly, increasing where it can be grown. Now, why would you want to do that? Because the further you can grow it, right across Europe, well, the more there is, the lower the price. And that's what it's all about, the cheapest raw ingredients. How can we make the cheapest litre of alcohol possible? And with all that money that we save, we'll then spend it on marketing, telling everybody why to drink it. Whichever fashion or fad there is, you know, at the moment, that's what we'll, we'll do. Now, I remember when, at Brooklady, when we started using French oak 
And I was vilified for that. All the talking heads, you know, the Bill Lumsdens and all the all the top whiskey people had a go at me. How dare you, you know, basically, how dare you use, you know, puffy French oak? You know, you know, that's not traditional. You know, they're all doing it now, all of them. And the thing is, I knew that French oak had been used for whiskey before. You know why? Because I grew up in a wine family. We bottled wine in London. I emptied French wine barrels, uh, bottled the wine, and I sent the barrels to distilleries in Scotland. You know, so give me a break. But because that's what we're dealing with. You're dealing with a marketing industry. It's yeah. very, very good, is it? And anything that comes along that seems to take people's attention has to be slammed down until they've worked out how to, you know, take advantage of it, which in this instance with French Oak became finishing and, and you know, finished in this, finished in that, which is actually the more existential issue, if you ask me, because what that's basically saying is forget the whole maturation thing. We'll use the cheapest ingredients possible, um, the crappiest wood we can find to save money. And then at the last minute, We'll go and add lots of, you know, caramel and coloring and some fancy chateau, some fancy oak, and then put that on the name, on the label. So everybody goes, oh, look at that. You know, aren't they special? You know, they put it in a you know, chateau, whatever barrel. That must be all. <clears throat> if you can't see through that, you know, yeah. you shouldn't be giving me a hard time. You know, you should <laughs> right. be giving them yeah, a yeah. hard time. You know, so this, this uh, I agree um, with 100 percent, 100 percent. And look, here's my, I've put my stake in the ground on Waterford 18 months ago after a bewildering six hour tour mm -hmm. with Ned and Megan. And Ned is in the audience tonight and hi Ned and, and hi Megan. And, and I thank you for such an eye opening experience because I left that day having my doubts answered. So he, here's my recommendation. You, you are, you need, if you're disputing the facts or the information being released from the distillery, either read or ask questions or have other people uh, inform you about scientific things where, where I'm not an expert on science, but I'll, I'll ask a scientist to maybe explain it to me so that you can first determine the facts and then decide if it's for you or not. And I think it's Mark is saying, and I'm going to, I'm going to steal from Mark's mouth, but I'm going to say, I don't think he wants everyone to buy the whiskey. It's only those who believe in it and who believe in the process and believe in the approach. Otherwise, what's the point? We should only buy what we believe in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, um, you, you, you're right there, Barry. Uh, the, you know, I'm not press ganging people into buying Waterford whiskey. You know, uh, you, you know, this is a free world, man. You, you buy what you want. You know, uh, uh, um, but if you're curious, if you are interested to know how whiskey is really made and, yeah. and what influences the flavour of your whiskey. Well then, by all means, join us and, and, and discover what we're what, what we're discovering. Share with us uh, uh, um, our discoveries. I'm not saying we're the best at it. I'm not saying this is the best whiskey in the world. But what I will say, it's the most profound. It's the most honest. Um, you know, it's only barley, yeast, and water. Now. I'm very careful about stipulating those three things. Yeah. And I'm not going to say what everybody else does. But that's what this is made from. Right. Barley, yeast, and water. Um, and that's all it is. It's, we, we call this barley forward. You know, some people aren't used to smelling barley like this, <laughs> unadulterated. <laughs> you know, they're used to it being masked by caramel and you know e150 or whatever fine fine you know it's like the difference between dairy you know you know you know dairy cream chocolate and having you know the, you know the real thing fine fine everything for different pockets different budgets let me ask whatever you this. fine let me ask you this before before people move on to accusing the the bottle shape of altering the flavor as well um let me ask you this the, the next year so it's been a tough year it's been a monumentous year it's the year you launched mm. the last 12 months you you launched your first whiskey you also couldn't 
get out there and tell people about it in person. Um, right. Then what, so there's been a myriad myriad releases over the past year, and I get the sense that there are many more to come. What does the next twelve months look like then from Waterford Distillery? Right. Uh, okay. Uh, um, so so these single farm origins. Uh, ooh, get that right. There you go. Uh, um, with their terroir code on the back, which has all the detail on it. Total disclosure. Uh, um, are actually components. There are components that are going to be used in um, the definitive bottling of Waterford. We call it the cuvee. Um, and this again is a, a concept that we've um, borrowed from uh, the wine world. Um, if you go to the great great wines of the world, uh, um, Chateau Latour, Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Margaux, all those sort of, this is what they don't do. What they don't do is harvest their 50 hectares and then put all the grapes together, mash them all up, ferment them, um, and then barrel them and then bottle them. That's not what they do. What they do is the five or so different grape varieties are grown around the property where the microclimate, the terroir is best suited to optimize the flavors of those uh, um, varieties. And then they are cultivated separately. They, they then are harvested separately. Uh, they are um, pressed separately. They are vinified separately. They are barreled separately. And then 18 months later, or two years later, they are assembled together, like a great chef does, with a great, you know, great cooking, um, to create the biggest mind mark possible. Um, so each of those component wines has its own identity, its own flavor, uh, um, you know, think of it like a graphic equalizer. Each one of these has it, it has the same compounds, but just in slightly different uh, um, levels of intensity. Yeah. So when you put them all together, you know, you get a bloody orchestra coming out. You know, you get a huge amount of noise. Uh, um, and that's what we're trying to achieve. That's why I talk about profound whiskey. Even I'm not arrogant enough to say the greatest whiskey. I hope it is, but it certainly will be the most profound, yeah. uh, the most honest, uh, because you're putting together mini Waterford whiskies with their own identities, like a Milfoy, you know, Gatto, layer upon layer upon layer, which will, in your glass, be revealed in reverse order, bing, 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 bing. Um, that's the aim. So, so these are building blocks that we're sharing with you now. And Ned um, is interpreting those, each one. He's learning the, the, you know, the different styles, what we're getting from each different terror, which again, the terror study has shown us. Uh, um, you know, some, some slightly strange things we've learned, like, for example, that the genetic parents of today's permitted varieties of barley are too close together. Mm. They were never selected for flavor. And for the last 50 years, we've wasted 50 years of potential propagation uh, um, development of the flavor. We're still back in you know, the early 70s as far as flavor is concerned, natural flavor in the, in the barley. You know, this has got to change. Who's in charge? Oh, uh, you know, it's the same same guys, you know. So, so part of this study is going to allow us, you know, uh, um, to identify in Ireland which terroirs are better suited to which flavor development, which might allow us then to propagate our own variety based on flavor. So for that reason, we're going back into history. We're growing 
barley, the, the one of the most famous varieties from 1960 called H uh, Hunter. Um, yeah. The most famous variety from 1900 called Goldthorpe. And a variety we know as Old Irish, which was from the Middle Ages. That's when they didn't faff around with it. That's when flavor was flavor. So we're having to go back. We took five grams of, I don't know what that is in ounce, five, five grams of seed from a bank, uh, uh, um, you know, locked up. And we've propagated it, bulked it up, got it bigger and bigger uh, um, so that we can see, I mean, I mean massively uneconomic, totally uneconomic, just as organic and biodynamic are. But, you know, hey, all the organic, all the biodynamic barley. I convinced farmers to grow biodynamic barley. It had never been grown before in Ireland. Um, and those you'll see this year, we're going to bottle that some of that. And boy, are you in, you know, the detractors are going to actually wet themselves. They, they, they are going to go <laughs> off the planet uh, um, when we get into biodynamics. They are going to lose it big time. I, well, I think you, you right have to now. come back for that. <laughs> that's that's a whole other discussion. Like when we get onto organics and biodynamics, that's oh, something you're going to have to come back, oh, you're gonna have to come back for. Um, oh, I don't wow. know. I, Boy, I, that, that, is that a grenade? Poof, you know, in the thing yeah, there. I, that, oh, that is going to cause such, such heartache. <laughs> I'm sure you're no, you're, you're not averse to throwing a grenade in the right way. Uh, and uh, mm. like I've said before, I put my stake in the ground after the visit to the distillery. And what I will say to the whiskey, the whiskey loving audience, the Irish whiskey fans, and if, you, if that's what you call yourself, if you think this is about a man coming in and telling Ireland how to make whiskey or saying he's got the best whiskey in the world, he's just told you both those points are not true. Um, and if you dare spend the time to look at the process, and if you still can't appreciate the process and one man's vision and putting his own money into fulfilling it, that's okay. But we can't relegate this whiskey to being garbage or whatever else you want to throw at it because you don't care to understand it or don't like it. It's subjective. Whiskey is subjective. We're not supposed to like everything. Uh, there's many, many whiskeys I don't like and, and, and so forth. But if you don't like, if you can't appreciate a process of heroing Irish grain, Irish farmers, Irish distilling, and what was the original style of Irish whiskey, let's be honest, before Potsil whiskey came about, we were making malt whiskey. It was Absolutely. the only style of whiskey. And before we added an E, we didn't have any E at all. And I don't think there's anything controversial here, and I can't get my head around the controversy. This is this is a unique approach. It's a, it's an authentic approach. Like it or love it or hate it, it's here. Uh, and I would just say that I think you're going to attract those people who firmly believe in your beliefs, Mark, as much as you attract those who believe yeah. in your whiskey. Yeah. Well, 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 thank you very much. Uh, you, you succinctly you know, summed it up very well. Uh, um, we're not trying to force people uh, into drinking something they don't want to drink. Uh, um, it's a, a principle that I firmly believe in from my wine background. I know it works because we started it in Brooklady, but we had the same hoo-ha over there. Uh, um, and, you know, some people don't like their world or you know, what they know being, being questioned. Yeah. Um, and they're uncomfortable by it. Well, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry if it makes you uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you know, but you know, but then look at the awards. You know, it, 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 within seven months of our first bottling, um, we, we 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 were lucky to win the Distillery of the Year and Brand Innovator of the Year. Um, you, you look at the the, the most famous. Uh, um, whiskey taster who's tasted over 10,000 different whiskeys, Serge Valentin. And I recommend you go and look at his, uh, he's got it all there on, on online, Whiskey Fun, it's called. I mean, he gave 90 points to uh, the organic. Um, That's what I'm sitting on here. Yeah, I have it here. It's only three years old. It's only, yeah. give me a break. This is only three years old. Yeah, it's well, staggering. The bottlings yeah. this year are going to be four years old. They're 25% older. And as we know, those flavor compounds are now you know, in the barrel. They're reacting with the air. And you know, they, they are being micro-oxygenated, which is what we know as maturation. Uh, um, and we are going to see more and more 
uh, it's going to become more and more obvious as, 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 as the time goes by. You know, what we are witnessing here is the beginning of something very, very interesting. Uh, um, we're at a very early stage. Um, and so a lot of people are trying to knock us on the head and get us out of the game uh, um, whilst they can sort of things. Right. I think there's an element of that, an envy yeah. and, you know, whatever. Uh, um, but give me a break. It, it, there's so much more. We've got uh, the organic, uh, um, we've got the biodynamic coming uh, this year. We've got something a little special coming the year after that. Um, we've got the cuvee coming out this autumn. You know, the culmination of bringing all these things together. I, I, I'm, you know, people at home can do this. You, you, could, you could take two single farm origins and put them together and see what you get. It's astonishing because somehow you end yeah. up with something even more flavorsome than the individual components. So we've had the audacity, if you want to call it, to actually show you an ingredient of what's going to be our main bottling. Yes. This isn't even the end game. It's just uh, the beginning. Uh, um, it's the beginning. Mark, if you could do one thing, uh, one request I would have, and I ask this of all distillers and distilleries uh, and founders is, to make more of the whiskies available in sampling sizes for us to enjoy and compare. Um, and I know that that creates all kinds of havoc and bottling lines, but mm. these are these are premium price points. And I think mm. that with the right sizes and price points, we can introduce more people to a different yeah, approach. Sure. And just throwing you, it out there. You, 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 I, I hear what you're saying. And, and I guess it'd be lovely to be able to do that. But you know the logistics is is you know the, the price of glass and the, and the different sizes and the different yeah. the different legal things and different countries uh, uh, um, it, it it is a nightmare and we took the decision not to do it at all uh, right. at this stage at this stage uh, um, you know what we what we hope uh, uh, people will do is they'll they'll share. You know, uh, um, I have a drinks counter out here with two or three, <clears throat> a few more uh, of these. And, you know, when my, 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 my neighbor, uh, a farmer down there, it comes uh, it, to see me. We start with one and chinwag and chat and everything. And then we move to another one. And, you know, it's no big deal. We're not doing a tasting. We're just drinking whiskey and having fun, which heaven forbid is what it's all about. Heresy, uh, Mark. Um, heresy. Uh, oh, you know, you know, you know, so, 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 yeah, sure. You know, that the, the, the you know people want to look and see it and stuff. But, but actually, you know, one of the one of the great things, it, 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 um, there's a French another oh another French phrase called the envie de boire, which means the desire to drink. And it came out after all that. Do you remember Robert Parker, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. A, a big wine uh, guy? Uh, like big heavy wines and everything uh, um and basically what it means is 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 you you have show stopping wines which everybody goes wow you know look ooh, you know huge great big you know wine you know but you don't actually want to drink it you know it's it's too much i know the envie de bois is a wine you or a whiskey you actually want to drink you know rather than just look at and go wow you know, and, 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 and we've got that in spades here. You know, this is a whiskey that you want to drink. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's begging for it. The purity is so good because, you know, again, economics, we leave on the table about 70,000 litres of potential alcohol we could take, mm. but we choose not to take because we don't want to infringe on the impurities either side of the middle cut. So, you know, economics, 70,000 liters, think about it, you know, add into that the, the, uh, uh, the uh, organic, the biodynamic with low yields, the heritage varieties with low yields, you know, it, you know it's not a cheap game, this, what we're doing, the, the, the route that we're taking. Uh, um, it, it, so, so that has to be, you know, t taken into account. Um, yeah. But well, I, I don't want you to think that 
And, and a point was well raised here by John Daly. Barry, please don't have Mark logging off thinking the whiskey community are all throwing <laughs> daggers at him. Um, oh, I'm used to it, don't worry. But a very large section of the Irish whiskey community understand and really appreciate his time, energy, passion, and fine spirit. Um, well, that's very kind. That yeah. is, oh, John that Daly, is, thank you. That is a great line. And I think that's representative of a, a thinking yeah. person and somebody who's willing to evaluate, listen, learn. And um, yeah, yeah, there sure. are too many. Yeah. 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 We're, 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 we're sort of going into a new territory, you know. You know, I, I've always treated this as, uh, you know, this is for wine drinkers. You know, mm. if you are a, a, a wine drinker, you don't go into uh, a wine shop and say, "Give me the same as I had last time," and what my father had before me. Uh, you go in, well, what's new? Tell yeah. me, you know, what, what what should I be buying? Right. You know, I've been a wine retailer. I know that's the biggest question of all. And and you introduce people to new things because you are very proud and, and, and of, of of what they are, and you want people to enjoy uh, uh, what you're you know, selling to them, and you want them to come back and buy more. Of course, of course, I do. Uh, um, so we're not going to serve. We don't want to put stuff in bottle that's completely undrinkable. I mean, what 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 was the point of that? that no, we, we're putting into bottle whiskey with an envie de voir, a desire to drink, a purity of spirit, the likes of which you're probably not used to having. Yeah. You're not used to having the barley forward, you know, in pole position. You're not used to having uh, um, high strength, you know, 50%, uh, you, you know, deliberately done at 50%, but perhaps not used to having water with it to dilute that 50%, because that's, that, that's the whole point of it. Um, but the barley forward, terroir driven, it yep. says it on the tin. That's what it is. And to some people, that's a bit of a surprise. Well, fine. You either okay. you know that's come okay. with us on the journey or go your own way. No. We're not as we're, Brian, we're not Brian Redden to... says Cincinnati, if you want to make everyone happy, sell ice cream. So you're not in the ice cream <laughs> business. Um <laughs> look, Mark, we, we could talk all night and uh, and we will at some point in person over a few whiskeys, um, I hope, uh, and get to blend uh, in person yeah. and make our own cuvee on, on a bar table. Yeah, isn't it fun? Isn't yeah. it fun? Isn't yeah, it fun? Absolutely. No, and that's yeah, what it should be. It's fun. Yeah. Well, thank I you wonder, much. Well, Mark, this has been incredible. Uh, this, is, this has been amazing. Yeah. You, you, I am a firm believer in your approach and I want that made clear uh, and that I believe in what you're doing. I believe in your process. I've believed it for the past 18 months. I've been a supporter and a fan and I will continue to be because it takes balls, guts, money and a a lot more to put your money where your mouth is and make a bet like this mm. and it's not a cheap bet and I hope it pays off mm. for you in more ways than just financial uh, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes from here but I'd love if you came back again maybe in the future and talked about oh, the organic exactly. side the biodynamic side oh there's be great. so much <laughs> yeah. Yeah, know, so, much, so much well thank you very much for, 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 for um, asking me on your show it's been a great pleasure uh, uh, um, you know I, I know it's uh, there's an awful lot to uh, you know, to talk about which is isn't that great <laughs> isn't right. it, 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 well, isn't it good that people are, are actually interested? You know, even if they are throwing bricks, you know, <laughs> you, know uh, um, you know, I mean, I mean, fine. I'd, I'd rather people talk about it than not talk about it at all. Hundred uh, um, percent. Um, anyhow, you know, the point is, you know, let, let's ha let's enjoy a, a, a dram of real, genuinely produced Irish pure, and you won't get a hangover. You won't get a hangover. Is that a promise? Is that a guarantee? We, 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 we can't put that on the label. You know, we're not allowed no. to put it on the label. But it's Guinness gives you strength. My, it's my experience. Uh, uh, um. <laughs> well, you've been, you've been a breath of fresh air, Mark, and I, I, I will spend all the time in the world with people who take a position, take a stand, and have a belief, and I love hearing about it. So... Please, please come back again, and there'll be. I'm uh, delighted to. Delighted to. Yeah. I can't tell you any jokes. I can't sort of prop up the bar with any old shaggy dog stories and, not, and old no. whiskey, you know, stuff. That's not. I, I'm not. You know, that's not my thing. We just <laughs> talk about the whiskey. Let, let's just talk about the whiskey, not the stuff over here uh, that makes you laugh and makes you, you know, you know, motive and, and everything. So, all I can talk about is what I do, which is which is this. I like it. So I love it. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, hey Mark, and, thanks and a girls. million. Thanks very much, Steve. And Staunch I'd be you. delighted to come and talk with you. Thanks. We'll see you, we'll see you again thanks. soon, Mark. Thanks a million. Appreciate it. Legend. Thanks, <laughs> thanks so much. Bye-bye. Amazing. Bye.
we all need a breather after that. Amazing, amazing. I don't often get worked up, but I'm going to get more worked up in the future because honestly, there's some ridiculous comments out there and I have to call, just call them out for their ridiculousness. So listen, I, I started this lock-in to celebrate Irish whiskey, to bring us together. And if we don't want to at least understand the process of whiskey production, if we care little for the passion, the money, the time that people are putting into making whiskey, don't waste your time coming to this lock-in. This is not for you. You don't have any, there's nothing for you here. This is about celebrating. And we can ask important questions. But I kicked a few people out of the room during the chat who started name-calling and hurling abuse and I've no time for you, I care little for you, and you're not welcome here. We're celebrating whiskey, we will continue to celebrate whiskey. If I don't like a whiskey, it's not going to be featured here. It's as simple as that. If there's a reason why certain whiskeys haven't featured on the lock-in, and you can all message me privately if you want to know more about why certain whiskeys aren't here, I'm here to bring people on that have an interesting story to tell, that are making good whiskey, that have a point of view, and that celebrate whiskey. If you don't think that man we just had on, Mark Rainier, celebrates Irish whiskey, you're missing completely the point. Missing the point. So, yes, I'm worked up. I'm amped up. And uh, poor Alex is going to have to follow that act now when he comes in and talks about West Cork in a second. But uh, I'll bring Alex in in a second. And I thank you again to Mark Rainier. Please do yourselves the service of exploring and understanding their process before dismissing it out of hand. Yes, it's a young whiskey, but as Mark has said, it's a building block. It's a component of what's coming. Um, is it a premium product? 100% it is. Is it 100% Irish? 100% it is. Uh, you don't have to like it. You don't have to like Mark. You don't have to care. But whatever you do, would you save the personal attacks for elsewhere? Because that anger is not uh, well received here, uh, put it that way. So let me look at some of the comments uh, here, okay. <laughs> Woo! I was going to say I need a drink after all that, because that's all I've been doing for the past hour and a half. Okay. <laughs> uh, please take a toilet break, uh, everybody. <laughs> the 110 odd people that I see here listening, would you take a toilet break? Uh, we, uh, yeah, and please give this video a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a hate or a dislike or report us for spam or something. I don't care, just take a position. Do you like it, do you not? It's not as important as just taking a stance and taking a position. I'm gonna to continue to hero interesting people and stories here. And I'll tell you what, I will uh, ask Mark back as many times as he's willing to join us because there's an interesting story there. And um, that does segue into the podcast we've been, we produced on behalf of Waterford Whiskey, which again, uh, I will share that Waterford had no hand in the editorial content and the editorial control of it. And what we've done with this podcast called Terroir Driven, the Waterford Whiskey Podcast, is I've asked the questions that you've been asking of smarter people than me, because I don't have the answers, but instead I went to the scientists, I went to the farmers, I went to the growers, I went to the distillers, the blenders, the bonders, the brewers, not just in Waterford, but in Texas, in Limerick, in Cork, further afield, to find out the answers to the questions you've asked, because I'm firm in the belief that most misunderstanding about Waterford is because of lack of understanding of the process. So let's have the experts explain the process objectively. And then finally, let's ask ourselves, does it matter? Do we care? And if we don't care, that's fine. On we go. But at least we've understood the process. As simple as that. We can't say fairer than that. All right. So, uh, so many great comments for Mark. Mark is the Don Quixote of Irish whiskey. Um, I want to party with Mark. He was wonderful. I listened to him again and again. Um, Mark and Patrick Miller from Talnua Distillery uh, in Colorado should do a joint show and continue the conversation about terroir. I agree with that. The attention to detail is how you know he cares. West Cork coming next. Brilliant. Yes, Alex is in the wings waiting to come on. Somebody says, get Barry a water. Get me a drip or something. Um, <laughs> all right. And uh, people saying the website is nearly as fascinating as the whiskey. Yes, vis visit... Waterford's website, which you will find at waterforddistillery.ie uh, and uh, waterfordwhiskey.com, and you will find some amazing uh, insights and behind the scenes, what an amount of content they produce. All right, let's bring in our next guest and let's swap out the whiskies because we are moving west along the coast. We're moving from Waterford in the sunny southeast to the west of Cork to the, uh, the less than sunny southwest. And we're going to bring on our next guest, and that is Mr. 
Alex Thibault, you are very welcome and thank you for joining us. How are you, Alex? I'm doing very well, Barry. How about yourself? I'm doing great. You have been sitting patiently in the wings and I've seen you roaring with laughter as you heard some of the responses and comments there. <laughs> well, it, it's just funny. It, and I don't know if you know this, but how full circle that that came for me. So for me, you know, my background, I was in the on-premise. Uh, and my first job in, in the whiskey business was working with Brooke Lottie. So I, my first videos were of Mark going on his terroir tangents and <laughs> you know I, I think that you know what he's saying and, and what you've been talking about is is paramount in what we celebrate with Irish whiskey is that not every bottle of, of whiskey is for everybody everyone's going to have a different view on how to go about making it and that's what makes the category exciting right that's why that's why we're here we're here because right now we're seeing some Incredible whiskeys come from Ireland. Nobody's making it the same way. And every single one of them should be celebrated. There's a different time for everything. But uh, yeah, it was kind of like following a hybrid of uh, like Ric Flair energy with Robin Williams personality. Um, so it's, it's tough to follow that one up. But uh, it's, it's great to see his passion. And, you know, I think that celebrating Irish barley and Irish grain is something that, you know, it is some of the best in the world. And and that's a, a tale that we carry west into West Cork, another distillery that uses, you know, 100% Irish grains. Now, are we doing single farm distillations and separate maturation? No, we're not doing that. But, but we are acknowledging and celebrating the fact that we're using, you know, that Irish grain that is some of the best in the world. Alex, um, this doesn't sound like the accent of somebody from West Cork. Um, what is this American accent doing talking about uh, the west of my proud county of Cork? Um, yep, and the last name is, is you know, very strongly French-Canadian. Um, however, uh, the 23andMe uh, does say 25% Irish, so at least a quarter of the blood is actually Irish. A uh, quarter. But um, I... Got myself into the whiskey business, like I was saying originally with Brooke Lottie. Um, you know, that was probably seven or eight years ago now. And with that, I had left and I, I worked for some brands with Irish distillers for a while. And for me, Irish whiskey, I think, uh, you know, really there's just such intrigue and such possibility with this category. Um, uh, I just think that for me, Irish whiskey was was this opportunity, not just you know from a, a work standpoint, but really just from a passion standpoint. We talk about something that we are on the the cusp of what the future of whiskey could look like, and I don't think that there's a brighter future than what we find in Ireland. Alex, tell tell us about your journey. So you talk about Brook Laddie. You've been involved. You've 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 dipped your toes in a, in a good way into the Irish whiskey world. We met when you were at a, a previous Irish whiskey brand uh, and now you found yourself at West Cork. Uh, what, do you remember your first introduction to Irish whiskey? Uh, my first introduction to Irish whiskey was probably when I was bartending when I was 18 years old and maybe even before then when I was, when I was bringing the bottles to the bar. Uh, but, but really then it was Bushmills and it was Jameson. Um, and, and I remember Bushmills where I grew up, um, and I grew up in uh, the southern coast of Massachusetts, where I grew up, I saw Bushmills more than I did Jameson. I don't know if that was a geographic thing, but but seeing the, the Bushmills white label uh, and trying that whiskey was really my first toe into what was Irish whiskey. And I think, you know, when I really got excited about it was probably when I first tasted Redbreast 12. I think that that was a turning point for me, you know, behind a bar um, in Boston of you know, all places to celebrate Irish whiskey in, in the United States. And, you know, I think that, um, I think that when we like think about what the concept is and what people think of Irish whiskey here in the United States, people go to that Jameson and Bushmills and, and trying something that had some depth and complexity really, uh, you know, caught my attention and wanted 
to get me to dive into this category a little bit more. West Cork distillers are a bit of an enigma. And it is one of the, I think, one of the most remarkable distiller, distillery stories of the past 10, 15 years in Ireland. And one that doesn't get mentioned a lot because I don't actually think they employ anybody to market the distillery. I think they, um, they invest less in marketing and telling anybody about what they do in true West Cork fashion of, uh, we don't want to be getting too big for our boots and we don't want to be telling people about what we're doing. But I wonder if you could lay, help us understand and help our audience understand how the formation of West Cork, it's a remarkable story and, and why these three gentlemen are so unique in the world of whiskey. Yeah, it, it really is a unique story. And um, I think that it's funny too, because it, it's reminiscent again of going back to my, the first time I encountered Mark was when I worked with Brooke Lottie. But, you know, you talk about a distillery that supports an entire city, town, region, um, and West Cork doing that uh, and really being started uh, by our three founders, the three lads, right? We had. John, we had Jerry, and we had Dennis there who were really not involved in the whiskey business at all. Um, two of them were working in the fishing industry. Uh, John had kind of bounced around in, in the different food outlets, and uh, I think he was working with Unilever for some time. And the opportunity came to, to start a distillery, right? The, they saw what could be the promise of, there we go, that's a nice slide right there. Um, they saw what could be the promise um, in the Irish whiskey business and really it started, we'll call it a glorified garage. Um, and, you know, to now today being uh, the largest Irish owned distillery um, that is making Irish whiskey that's readily available in the United States of America. So it is a really unique story. Um, I think that in terms of, you know, marketing, if it, there, it's a new thing uh, to the West Cork brand, but, you know, with that being said, um, I think one of the ways that West Cork has really utilized what would be, you know, you, you see marketing coming from larger brands rather than put up the billboards and, and put in the, the pages in your local advertisement, you know, we're putting the value onto the shelf. And I think that investing in making exceptional whiskey uh, and, and putting it at a price point, we all know that, I mean, whiskey is not getting any cheaper. Uh, you know, tomorrow. And I think being able to go into your local retailer and find a lot of these bottles for an approachable price point, that's, that's where we would rather spend our dollars currently. That makes sense. It makes sense. Um, the, I, I think that the, the three founders and John, they're, they're very private people. Uh, I've never met them. Um, and in full disclosure, I own a cask of single pot cell whiskey that's sleeping in the distillery. I've never seen it. Uh, at some point I will, and at some point I'll drink it empty. Um, but I have a cask there. And I was in, back in November, when Mrs. Stories and Sips and I went to Ireland before lockdowns really hit, we went to West Cork and we stayed in Skibbereen and we spent two weeks in Skibbereen and, and a couple of the lads from the distillery reached out, they saw we were there and they sent a few bottles over, very nice of them. Um, but they were saying, I said, you know, one time I should, have, it would be great to get John on the podcast, you know? And they looked at me and they said, geez, I don't think John's ever been on a podcast in his life. And, uh, and it just sums up, I think, their approach, which is they're too busy making things and doing things to put themselves out in front of the whiskey. Yeah, and I think that, and I, I've spoke to John about, you know, we're, we're going to try and get John on a couple podcasts, whether, you know, get him on the lock -in. it yet. We're, we're, we'll get him on the lock-in. I think that, you know, from having a pure chemist come into a conversation about terroir, that would be, you guys could be locked in for four or five hours. Um, I think with, uh, you know, with, with kind of his thought process about the whiskey, he's, that's what he comes from. He comes from that chemistry background and the wheel is all gears are always turning in his head about, you know, what could we do next from a chemistry standpoint? How is this going to be different from the other? And I think that, you know, it's, it is something that is intriguing about this brand is, you know, we've been in the United States for probably less than 10 years. Um, we're bottling all of our own distilled spirit. And I think that when we look at what the future looks like, you know, we are again on the cusp of what the future in Irish whiskey is going to look like. And, and we're providing some really unique whiskeys. Um, and I think that that's something too, that 
you know, when we talk about the two whiskeys that we have tonight, like some people will go and grab a bottle of bourbon cask and say, well, this doesn't taste like, you know, a, a traditional blended Irish whiskey. And there's an absolute reason for that. And, you know, we talk about what the build is of it. It is drastically different from what you'd come to expect from a traditional blended Irish whiskey. So you suggested, we, we talked during the week and you said, okay, there's two whiskeys I want to feature. The bourbon cask was one, and then the bog yep. oak charred cask was the second. Um, I have never had the bog oak charred cask, so I've got a lovely bottle of it here. And I've just realized how deep the punt is on the bottom of the bottle. That's pretty impressive. Uh, like yeah, pouring it a, for a champagne pour. <laughs> I like it. Um, the, so I've, I have uh, tasted the bourbon cask before, and we've featured on the lock-in, and, and I'm delighted now that we get to talk about it a little bit more. Um, some of the things I'd love to know about tonight are... West Cork have been producing, and, and we don't need to address them all right now, but that we'll get to over the course of the evening is West Cork has been producing whiskeys for quite a while. Some of their whiskeys um, are already making their way to shelves. Others have been sourced while they're waiting for whiskeys to, to mature, as is the case with many with many distilleries and brands. Um, and I'd like to get maybe some, whatever you can share, understanding of that. Uh, and I'd love to yeah. know where, what the the goals are, because there's just so much being produced in West Cork from gins to whiskeys and I'd love to know, is there a, is there an approach? Is there a DNA? Is there a, is there something that'll make West Cork, West Cork? Um, and so that's something maybe I'd love to get an understanding of as you may, maybe talk us through these two whiskeys tonight, but just those are big questions that are in my head. Yeah. And I think that some of the things like, and let's, let's talk about one of those things right now is, is yes, West Cork distillers makes a, a good amount of spirit. Now, whether it is gin whether it's, you know, neutral grain spirit, whether it's still with the, you know, is, is being sold off. But West Cork whiskey is an entirely different thing going forward, right? Wow. If you owned a, if you owned a, a massive distillery and you had the choice of keeping, you know, what you thought was your best distillates in your best casks and had the opportunity to put it into bottle, that's exactly what you do. And I think that that's where we stand. And when we talk about the amount of spirit that's being made, you know, like something like Garnish Island Gin, which is made by Deidre Bohan uh, at our facility, you know, it seems like we're making a lot of liquid, but like she's still, in terms of the herbs that she's using to build the flavor profile of Garnish Island Gin, she's clipping them from her garden on the way in. So yes, we're making a, a good amount of spirit, um, but, what it looks like going forward is, you know, there's always going to be a, a good amount of production there, but what we are planning on doing is always going to be, you know, number one, uh, using a pot still, right? And I think that that's something that's very unique. Even when we talk about our grain, all of our grain is produced in a pot still. Um, using only Irish grains, that's something that West Cork whiskey is going to be leaning on. And I think that looking at what it is going forward we're going to have the the standards like the bourbon cask um, but the experimentation that we see with something like the glen gareth series and we're talking bog oak tonight you know we have the peated out there now um this is something purely uh innovative that you know, came into john's head one day and said well why don't we try it i think that that's the magic of where we are with irish whiskey right now is a hey, let's try it idea is not a bad idea, right? We can we can try something and build and and maybe, you know, we create something out of it that is really intriguing. And I think that's where we are at the bottom. So from a brand standpoint, yeah, we're making gin there, dedicated gin still. Deirdre is the gin distiller. You know, she handles the gin. John does all the whiskey. She handles the gin. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of what we have and – in bottle and you know what has been sourced in the past um things that you are seeing you know from west cork going forward this is all of our own liquid right so what you see here are all things that have been distilled at west cork uh so whether it is our bourbon uh bourbon cask through the glen Gareth series the black cask or our eight-year-old single malt these are all things that have been produced at the distilleries so that's news to me so I, that's great to hear i wasn't aware that that's the case so so you've got, let me see, you've got the bourbon cask, you've got Glen Gareff series, you've got, what else have you got there? Yep. I see you've got... The black cask. Black cask and the barrel proof. Uh, I actually have the eight year. 
Okay. I have some hiding back here too. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's always nice to keep a bottle or two hiding behind it. Um, so you have the peated there, and then we do have the the stout and the IPA cask finishes, which we've released you know this past summer. All of this is our own liquid. Amazing! I didn't realize. I was for some reason I still thought that a portion of it was still sourced. But that's great to hear. So, um, what what would be the youngest whiskey that was produced in in West Cork that is now in bottles, uh, or what is it, what is the oldest? Um, do we know? So so we're seeing. I mean, like in any of our whiskeys, the youngest whiskey that we're going to be using is four years old. Um, okay. That is our baseline. So four year old whiskey at least. Um, and in terms of the oldest whiskeys, you know, we are, we're kind of keeping some, some older things under wraps as we look at different casking and different finishes. Um, I think that, you know, laying down the stock, seeing how it kind of matures and, you know, we'll see, um, when they determine it's right, when, when whiskey is ready, it's ready, right? So we're not going to rush anything. We're going to lay down the distillate, see what happens. Um, and, you know, in terms of the oldest casks that are there, I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah. You know, I know that we have really been seriously distilling uh, in good volume for over a decade now. So, you know, you can kind of put a guesstimate on it, um, but you know, I cannot give you a definitive number of the oldest stock that we have. Maybe your cask, who knows? How long ago were you buying? Mine is, no, mine's new. Mine is only a year old, and I know it's a year old because I just got my... Uh, I just got my storage fee invoice uh, yes, this week, so I, I got to pay my 18 euros to store the thing um, for the next year. <laughs> well, hey, at least you know it's still there, right? You get that invoice, it's and there. it's like, okay, it's still there. Um, I, um, but yeah, I, think, I was, you know, talking. I was about there during the lockdown, like when when the um, in November, sadly, it was level five in Ireland where you couldn't go and visit, and I was dying to go and just stroke the the wood of my cask and just. Maybe give it a kiss. You know, it's the only cask of whiskey I own in the world. And I thought, uh, someday I'll see it. I'm, I'm sure it's not going to be the last. Um, but, you know, and recently, actually, you know, in Skidreen, we had an issue with uh, the COVID, you know, uh, COVID going around because it actually shut down our bottling hall for a short period oh, wow. of time recently. Um, because it had, I think... It was, you know, the West Cork area had the highest concentration uh, of of COVID transmission for a short period of time, or something along those yeah. lines. So, yeah. um, it it really has affected the business, um, and not like affected the business of like, oh no, you know, we don't have bottles, but just it's when you live and breathe something the way that you know the people who work at West Cork do. It's not just shutting down the bottling hall, right? It's like okay, well, what am I doing with my day? Because this is what my life is, is, is being a distillery. Can, can we talk about that for a second? Because before we get to sip on the first bourbon, the bourbon cask, um, Skibbereen in West Cork, for those of you who are not familiar, it is one of the most beautiful parts of Cork. West Cork is just stunning. We we spent two weeks in Tregumna, which is just outside Skibbereen, just on the coast. And um, Skibbereen has a, has a very a turbulent history. It was probably the, the worst hit part of Ireland during the famine uh, in the 1800s. Um, and there's a famine museum actually in Skibbereen. Uh, uh, Skibbereen was decimated. I mean, it was practically wiped out in the, in the middle of the 1800s. And uh, West Cork distillers, like this needs to be mentioned, West Cork distillers, there isn't a family in, in Skibbereen that isn't either directly employed by West Cork uh, distillers or who doesn't know somebody immediately that's, that's employed there. Um, and it's, it's been a remarkable and incredible gift to the people of West Cork and to the people of Skibbereen and a massive part of the um, of the economy there. And for that, we should be just, we, that's not just another great success story. We should be celebrating John and the and the two lads for just putting their money where their mouth is, taking a risk and just constantly investing, investing, investing with their heads down. And so many families depend on them now, don't they, on a day-to-day -day basis? Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny when they started the, they're from an even smaller town uh, outside of Skibbereen. And I think, uh, I heard John say it in one of the uh, recordings that we have of him, but he, he was saying how there are three families, the, the three gentlemen who started the distillery, uh, the town that they were from, I think that there was maybe 120 people. And they were like, so their immediate family accounted for 
thirty percent of the population of that town, or or something along those lines. So the Union Hall I mean, was it was a Union Hall. It was Union Hall. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know when we're talking about a place that is uh, you know a, as small as Skibreen and bringing an operation like this to a small town like that, it is going to be um, you know it's it's, it's going to bring a lot of jobs to the area. It's going to be a huge uh, impact to what is happening in West Cork. So um, the distillery is more than just a distillery. Why don't we start sipping on a bit of this West Cork nectar um, and and talk some more about about the, the things that are taking place there? Um, and while we're, I've, I've poured my bourbon cask, but Ed Powers uh, has a very random comment that says, somebody brought Barry a bag of fish. Yeah, when I was in Skibbereen, um, Kieran Quinn, who's also in the audience, his brother lives in Skibbereen. And when Kieran knew I was there, contacted his brother. His brother brought me a bag of fresh fish. And that's pure West Cork. If they know you're there, they'll bring you a bit of fish. Um, anyway, that's a little random aside there, tangent. <laughs> and, and I mean, had it been, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, two of the founders would have also brought you some fish fresh off the boat because there you go. You know, that's They're what they were doing prior to the distillery. That's right. Uh, that's right. So yeah. With the bourbon cask, I think what what you're seeing here, um, there it is now. Your camera is far better than mine. Um, with the bourbon cask, this is a blended style Irish. Now, you know, when we think blended style Irish whiskeys, uh, it's, it's some marriage traditionally of bourbon and sherry, and, and maybe you get into second fill or third fill bourbon casks. Um, what we're doing with the bourbon cask for West Cork is uh, we're looking at pot distilled wheat, which is what all of our grain whiskey is. So top to bottom, all of our grain whiskey is pot distilled wheat. Um, from there, yeah. So I know, you know, predominantly corn is used a lot, but one of the things that makes this drastically different is we're using all pot distilled wheat. Now for all of our grain distillate. So we're looking at about 75% um, of pot distilled wheat as what goes into our bourbon cask. Now from there, uh, single malt whiskeys. And, you know, we actually do about a quarter of our malting at West Cork. So I know that there's not a lot of people who are doing it now. It's just become so cumbersome and not cost effective. Um, so to be able to be doing some of our own malting at the facility using wheat, wheat delivers an entirely different flavor profile to this. And I think that it's really interesting because you look at, you know, what's happening in American whiskey, uh, in, in bourbon specifically, people are going crazy for weeded bourbons. And I think that talking about that wheat component, um, it, it's going to change the whiskey's flavor profile and body entirely. Um, if you were to pick up a bottle of West Cork bourbon cask and be anticipating something that was you know, a majority of something that was produced in a column still versus this body wise, this is going to feel much heavier. Um, and then aging exclusively in first fill bourbon casks. That's what we do with this. Um, and working with, with, um, Kelvin Cooperage to source really the, the best bourbon cask that we can. Um, you know, John will always discuss how he likes to lean on, you know, whether it's Jim Beam or heaven Hill casks, younger style bourbon casks, because they have even more, to give, right? They haven't they haven't given so much to the bourbon that they have nothing left to give to the Irish whiskey. So using some of those younger bourbon casks, you get a lot more of that American oak flavor profile coming through here. So I think this, again, for a, a you know, I don't want to call it a value whiskey. I want to say like for a, a whiskey that you can go out and purchase and not break the bank, right? I always talked about bottles of whiskey like I have bottles of whiskey that I sip on or, you know, Barry, if, if you come to the Northeast, we'll sit down and we'll open up a bottle. But I have some friends who don't necessarily know, you know, what the hell they're doing when it comes to drinking whiskey. And I think that for a bottle like this, right, this is something where I can pick it up, casually sip it, whether it's neat on the rocks, go on the, the road of a cocktail. Um, but also, you know, if my friends can enjoy this, and I'm not upset the next morning when I left my bottle, uh, you know, not being guarded and it's disappeared. 
Um, Famously, I, um, don't, don't, don't the lads in West Cork walk around with spanners in their back pockets to be fixing the stills and hammering and, and making the stills themselves? Is it true that the stills, some of the stills were made in West Cork, like by hand? Yeah, uh, they, they've absolutely made some of the stills. And it is, it is very much hands-on uh, engineering that's happening at West Cork. And one of the stills they made, uh, you know, they talk about the rocket. And the rocket is this still, you know, it's, it's the fastest still in the world. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we have actual paperwork that says it's the fastest still in the world. However, um, what we talk about is that it can go from, you know, room temperature to, you know, a, in our full distillation. Um, and I think it's less than 10 minutes. So <laughs> it is something where... John leaned more on his chemistry background and said, I think that there might be a way that we can, you know, create something that can just heat in this incredibly short time span and really start producing whiskey as fast as we possibly can. So the, the ingenuity um, that we're seeing happening at the distillery is something that is very much, uh, you know, we're, we're taking it into our own hands in terms of building what the future of West Cork looks like, literally, uh, by you know, <laughs> building some of these components that go into our stills. Um, I, I I love that, and that's why I want to hear more stories from the lads. Like I want to hear more about West Cork, and I think, and please pass along what for whatever it's worth. We, West Cork Distillers is doing us all a disservice by not sharing the wonders of West Cork through their storytelling and by appearing when they're not busy manufacturing rocket stills and uh, making whiskey. But <laughs> we'd love to learn so much. Like West Cork has so much to give the world, and I want to hear more from the lads. And I hope they, uh, I hope they agree to your your uh, your pushes. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this: uh, my pushes will come, but uh, you know, hearing it from you as well, I think that. You know the it's it's funny because you have someone who is as brilliant uh as as john who he he wants to go about making whiskey and he's like well nobody really wants to hear from me talk about whiskey right like i'm gonna go about making it why why do we really need to speak about it and you know it's um it is something that i think will change from us going forward when we look at um the availability to open up some of these bottles to have the conversations about what we are doing there. Um, yep. That's, you know, why I exist. Um, the reason why I exist, so that way we can give you some more of those stories. We can, you know, open up a few of these bottles and show how different some of these whiskeys are. I mean, like what you're drinking now. The bourbon cask we're is glad, night and day. We're glad you exist. Uh, I'm <laughs> glad you exist, Alex. Like, this is important. <laughs> yeah, as a no, human and as a West Cork representative. Um, the So what could you help us understand the flavors that wheat would give as opposed to corn when it comes to creating what would be typically a grain whiskey. And I don't even know, how do you call this a grain whiskey if it's technically made in pot stills? Um, well, well, so anything that you're making outside of, uh, you know, if you're not using malt, if you're not using barley and you're using some other cereal grain, it is a grain whiskey. Um, now, whether you're producing in a pot still or a column okay. still, using one of those cereal grains is going to produce a grain whiskey. I think for me, you know, the wheat um, delivers a drier, spicier uh, flavor profile. Not not all the way, you know, on the other side of things. Not like a rye, but it, it brings a little bit of a lighter. Um, I, I would say more cereal-driven grain. But for me, the difference is really the body of the whiskey, because we're not using a column still, because you're using a pot still. I think it, it feels like there's a bit more weight. To this it's heavier for a yeah. blended it's style whiskey. Now the other yeah. thing is too is if we talk about what the ratio looks like for this blend. You're looking at 75% of that that grain and 25% malt. So there is a really high malt content for something like this, which is our you know yeah. our standard blended whiskey. Mm. There's a, a pronounced weight to it on the palate. That biscuity. There's a kind of a biscuity maltness does come through that high percentage of malt you get that what you might call maybe graham cracker kind of malt profile that we know in ireland's kind of biscuits comes through fairly strong but there's a lovely sweetness on the nose and on the palate as well um, and i'm wondering is that from the is that the bourbon first fill bourbon cask influence yeah and i think that that's the first fill bourbon cask influence 
but also when we look at you know the the rough age of what we're using here for so long and and i think that this was a conversation maybe we had the last time we were together you know people have always put this huge weight on on the number that's on the bottle right letting age dictate the quality of the whiskey and younger whiskeys have exceptional flavors to lend to the bigger picture of the overall whiskey that goes into your bottle. So here, when we look at what whiskeys we're using, you look at first fill bourbon casks. First fill bourbon casks deliver a huge amount of flavor in a short period of time. So mm. leaning on four to eight year old whiskeys to make our bourbon cask delivers a lot of those, those sugars that we're able to harvest from those white American oak casks. Um, and I think that's probably where that sweetness is coming from. But that biscuity kind of mid palate is what really, I think, makes this different for me. And this is a very affordable whiskey, isn't it? What, what does it sell for in the Northeast, the bourbon cask? In the Northeast, you can see it for around $25 a bottle. Um, that's incredible. That's you incredible. know, and, and at $25 a bottle, again, you, we're not seeing sub $30 prices anymore for anything that that we're really going out there and, and searching for. And I think that this is one of those bottles that I love to, if, if you're going in and you're planning on spending a hundred dollars, you know, pick up your $80 bottle of whiskey and taste the, the $25 bottle of whiskey side by side, because it does. I think for what the price point is, it, it really over delivers because you get that weight, right? That weight, I think for me is, is synonymous with a higher price tag whiskey. Is there going to be more of a push, Alex, for West Cork to get into more states? I know there's, I think Bourbon Cask is in Ohio, but, um, and I think there was some, as I posted earlier in the week about you joining us, there was lots of people saying, well, hey, I'd love to have West Cork where I am. Um, will we expect to see more of kind of an expansion in the next 12 months? Um, I don't know about the next 12 months. I would love to say yes. Um, I think that Ohio is a very tricky state. Um, we... That twenty-two dollars to New York today. Um, that's that's great. Uh, even better. Um, but you know, Ohio. We did have more expressions listed in Ohio for a period of time. But as you know, control states are really an issue um, to work with, and it just makes it a little bit difficult. So um, you know, definitely on my radar to try and put this bottle onto the shelves across the entire country. I mean, I would love yeah. to. I would love to, I would love to be able to say, go to your corner store and you'll be able to find a bottle of bourbon gas on the shelf. Right. Um, is that the aspiration? Sure. We would love to be able to do that in the future. Um, but I would say, you know, absolutely keep your eyes out for West Cork and your local stores, uh, because we are going to be increasing our footprint. Um, but to give you a, a strict timeline, I wish I could say everyone will see it in 12 months, but you know, expansion takes time. It does. It does. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so I, I think that I think that for us, we are we're really the Northeast is our stronghold. Um, if you are, you know, New York and, and north of that, we have great distribution here. Um, you know, people now have interacted with me on some social media. Um, anyone can reach out. I'm an open book. I would love to find West Cork for you if you happen to be like. You know, I, I think we interacted with somebody who said, I'm in Washington, where can I find it? I'll yeah. send you a list. You um, did, that was great. I saw that today, it was amazing. And I, I'm happy to kind of give people the information because right, we, to, to go in the same way and something that Mark was discussing earlier is, you know, we right now are not, we don't have the budget to put it everywhere. We are, you know, kind of being targeted with where we need to, to be and I think, you know, we're finding these new places and we're finding this kind of uh, want and desire for the, for West Cork, the brand. And I think that being able to deliver that is something that we're looking at definitely going forward. It's no small task. And, and Alex, you, you've been involved in, in Irish whiskey for quite a while as well. And you've seen the challenges of the different States. And, you know, we had a few drinks in Boston a while back and talked about some of that as well. And um, the 50 different States giving you 50 different challenges. Um, but, what I've noticed is that once you start getting people interested in the story 
and you start getting people connected to even things like people who'd never heard of West Cork today. I saw on the Facebook group share uh, commenting saying that's a really neat label, how they've captured West Cork on the label. And even that's just an opener for a conversation. And then you get to say, oh, yeah, well, if you look closely, you'll see Union Hall and you'll see where their, their trawlers came in. And, you'll hear, you know, you can talk about their story. Now they're in Skibreen and they've expanded. And I think there's a great story. These lads, that I, I, I think, is especially in these times where we're all craving connection and community. That's what's been built in Skibreen. And that's a that's an easily transferable story into, into the United States, I think. Yeah, I think that again, it's 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 this whole concept of you know we're not shouting from the rooftops, and maybe that's the fault of our, our own so far. Um, and I think that you know we would rather tell the story um, than than shout it from the rooftops. And and opening up these bottles, being able to have the conversations, whether it's the one like we're having tonight, or eventually you know being able to go into a city and open a few bottles and start talking about yeah. it, start introducing it because it, it is beautiful. The story is incredible um, at what these guys have put together. And I, I just think that what we're going to be doing going forward is, is really taking the time to discuss the story, discuss the whiskey, because even just telling you, you know, how we're going about making our grain whiskey is so drastically different from the norm. And it really is. And there's even questions in here about that because I think there's that's a very unusual thing. I didn't know that the wheat, that wheat was the ingredient, the grain used in what you're calling the grain whiskey, and that's a whole other. You could go an hour into the definitions there of what single grain, what's pot still, what 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 you call a pot still being, what you call a distillate that comes out of a pot still that's not barley, um, and whether you can call it single grain. I don't know. It's these are complex topics, but. Even those things alone are stories, you know, and they're, they're opportunities for conversation and to dive into it. Um, but one, like when I was sharing earlier in the week that we were having you on, um, and I and actually yesterday when I shared a video of opening the box, a couple of comments came in from Ireland saying that the West Cork barrel proof, which I have here, which is what, 62%, is the greatest valued Irish whiskey in the world. Like this was unanimous from the comments that came in, like, I, I looked online. It's like forty-five dollars for a bottle of barrel-proof, sixty-two percent alcohol, blended Irish whiskey. Yeah, and um, you know that was. It, it's funny because it was kind of started as a challenge um, with John, and uh, one of the original consultants on the distillery uh, had kind of said something to John about, you know, okay, if you take the components of what you were thinking about doing for a barrel proof whiskey and you know you, you just quickly vat them together and bottle it um you know you're not going to get as great of a result as if you marry them together go into cask let it rest and then go to a bottle from there and that was really the challenge and from that um john was proved wrong and he said well actually no it, it it's correct that at, after it rests just for a bit in cask and you get the, because again, that's a blend. Um, and, and again, leaning on a higher malt content, you're looking about two, uh, two to one there, right? Two to one with that grain distillate uh, and, and then malt from there. Um, and it came out at 62%, you know, it's, it really does over deliver, I think. And, and that's something that can be said for the entire portfolio, I think, is for what you're, what people are accustomed to paying now, the, what you're getting in the bottle over delivers for the amount that you're spending at the register. I I didn't advertise that I'd sample this, but I have to try it. I have to try the barrel proof. And I want to try it with you because you were kind enough to send me these bottles and I want to share the experience and uh, apologies in advance to everybody else who doesn't have it on standby, but we'll get onto the bog oak then. But I just, it's, from what people are saying, this is a flavor that I just need to experience. <laughs> And that's a lovely sound. Oh, isn't it? I'll be on my ear after this now between the Waterford that I was downing and now barrel proof West Cork. Well, um, and it's 62%. Um, and, and I think that that's 62% is something that scares people off. Um, but when you look at how we go about making the distillate and, and really making a lighter style distillate, um, 62% does not need to be abrasive by any means. And I think here it's absolutely warming. Uh, 
and you know, well, you were living in Ohio for a long period of time. Um, you know, maybe you don't need the warming now. Um, well, but living in the north, living in the northeast, we absolutely need the warmth. Um, the sixty-two percent is warming, but again, I think that there's that little bit of sweetness that carries it through to that mid palate, and that wheat distillate, that that biscuit note. That's something that's pretty harmonious, I think, through the entire portfolio. So this is, again, uh, a blend of malt and grain, the grain being wheat. And you said this is a, is this a higher percentage of wheat than the bourbon cask? Um, it's actually or, a lower percentage of wheat. So you're lower. looking at roughly two to one. 66% wheat distillate to that 33% malt. Okay. So There's a bigger such a, malt component. I see. On the nose, it's like a hard candy, like a boiled sweet in Ireland. Like there's this kind of a, a cooked sugar um, like a hard sugar. If you made, you ever see these chefs make these wonderful sugar sculptures when they cook the sugar, there's a wonderful smell on the, on the nose. Almost Ooh. in the way of like a caramel, but not, not quite, um, like a brittle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 62% is just how it arrived. Like, so after how, how long was it matured from so it, it had a higher percentage coming off the stills went into the casks reduced pr presumably a little bit in it the came cask? down it, it came down uh, a little bit in the cask so typically i mean we're going in high 60s low 70s into barrel itself um and then really from there around 62 is where we saw it now again you need to build some sort of consistency so putting it at 62 rather than you know, having to having to register batch to batch at 62.4 rather than 61.8. Um, being at 62 was really that consistent mark for us. Mm. Ooh. That's amazing. It's that it's heat. big. It is. There, there is some there's some heat there. Again, uh, and one of the things I think, you know, the method in John's Madness of using those younger style bourbon casks that still have some some life to them. Um, you know, here, all of the whiskeys that we produce all go into first fill bourbon casks immediately, right? So we're not going into a second or third fill. We're not putting distillate directly into sherry. Everything goes into a first fill bourbon cask. If it is recast from there, that I mean, that depends on what we go about producing. Um, but I think there is that little bit of sweetness that carries through. You get the heat, slight sweet note, and then we get into the body of what that whiskey is. You, you do get the heat, but not the, at 62%, obviously we could legally be having, you know, this is legally hand sanitizer and I could take the wallpaper off the walls with it if I wanted to. But it's, it's, there's a, it's like cotton candy. I don't know if you get that note, but it's cotton candy. It's. It's it's hard boiled sugar. It's Werther's original. It's it doesn't. Kieran asks, does it feel like a sixty two percent? It doesn't. Ask me again in an hour when I'm crawling along the floor on my hands and knees. <laughs> but at the moment, it doesn't. It it feels warm, but it do, the the heat does not mask that cotton candy flavor. Just like pink pink cotton candy is what I'm tasting. And you know what? It always helps to drink uh, to try barrel proof whiskey as your fifth or sixth whiskey of the night. Um, you know, it, when it's the first, sometimes it, it feels a little bit hotter, but, um, but no, I, I a hundred percent agree with you. I think that there is that, that sugar sweetness, that, that caramel, that toffee, um, whether it is like a, a brittle, like a nut brittle, um, almost that comes through, but the 62 does not feel abrasive. No, it's, I not mean, I've had more abrasive 40% whiskeys than this, um, and some of them come with little uh, little hoodies on the neck of the bottle. <laughs> um, Dana says you had me, or Stacey says you had me a cotton candy. Um, does it linger? Asks Greg. It does. There's a bit of length to this, isn't there? It doesn't dry out immediately. It's not. There's there's some length to it. Yeah, and I think I mean, obviously something that's barrel proof. Um, the essential oils that you're seeing in there really, I do think, stick around for quite a bit because. For me, it's not so much uh, the, the finish, um, but it, it might be more so on the, like the side of the tongue. Um, it, it kind of coats and stays, and, and I think it yeah. just resonates. Resonate would be a word rather than linger. 
resonates. Linger is uh, is is negative. Like we don't want you to stay after the party is over. Like the door is open. Will you not leave? Go yeah, home. yeah. You're it, 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 everyone went to bed twenty minutes ago. It's time to time to leave. Now. <laughs> um, no, and I, I think you know that's extraordinary. Joy, joy, saying you know candied citrus peel. Um, undertone of citrus absolutely but adding that sugar element to it right like like a, a brulee um lemon creme brulee yeah. right like if, yeah, yeah, if you were kind yeah. of going down that direction if your creme brulee and someone gives you just the, the essence of the lemon over the top of it i wouldn't try this the first like you said the first whiskey of the night this is your fifth whiskey this is your i'm going to bed in a minute whiskey <laughs> this is your like well, did this sweater get warmer? Uh, whiskey, like when you hit number five, you know, you start dipping into the battle proof and they start flowing down a little bit easier. Do you think, Alex, that, you know, there's a movement at the moment for, especially in Ireland, and Dave, Dave Mara, who's one of our, our, our friends, he's in the audience, he, he has this hashtag in Ireland called Cask Strength Crusade, which is trying to prompt and, and uh, encourage distilleries to release whiskeys at a higher proof because that's how maybe a lot of Americans might be used to consuming, especially at the higher end, their bourbons. And there, there tends to be, from my experience, and I have a amateur palate, and I'll, I'll defer to you to give me a better answer, but there tends to be a lot more flavor at barrel strength. And Mark mentioned earlier that if you add water to the right whiskey, you're not diluting the flavor at all. But if you add it to the wrong whiskey, you are diluting the flavor. I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Does water do more than just reduce the alcohol? Does it eliminate some of that flavor that we're getting? I don't believe so. I think that, you know, in, in terms of delivering barrel proof or cask strength whiskeys, I mean, I, I would like to give everyone the opp opportunity to make the whiskey exactly what it is to them. You know, so maybe you're saying, hey, you know, like 54% is, is my sweet spot, right? Like, and that might not be mine. So, in terms of, of giving people the opportunity to to kind of take the raw, uncut whiskey and and kind of bring it to where they find it most palatable, yeah, everyone's gonna, you know, it's gonna release different flavor profiles at different times. Um, you know, for me, I like one small ice cube with a, a cast strength whiskey, and I think drinking it over the course of 40 minutes or so and seeing how it changes, not just from a dilution standpoint, but also from a temperature standpoint on your palate mm. is really interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think leaving things cask strength or barrel proof, it affords the opportunity to find flavors that you may not discover in 40%. Um, and whether that is on the high end at 62 or whether it is as you start to dilute down. This is, an incredibly flavorful whiskey. Like I love a sweeter whiskey. I I tend to veer towards one of our maybe shared interests of red breasts. Cat, you know the the fortified wine finishes. You know I love a sweet treacly Malaga Marsala port sherry. Oh, give me give me those all day long. But now you've achieved it here with none of those things, with just first fill bourbon and wheat and barley. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, also a sucker for fortified wine. And, you know, we have some expressions overseas right now that we're seeing different fortified wine, whether it's port or, or sherry casks. Um, you know, we do have uh, some available in the United States now from some older supply of, of 12 year old whiskeys that were in port and sherry. So we do have a fortified wine, um, you know, kind of look on some of the whiskeys, but I think really what we're able to accomplish looking at bourbon casks and looking at manipulating that mash fill a little bit uh, to create a flavor profile, like you were saying, where it's getting that, that candied, you know, toasted sugar, uh, caramel, yeah. overly caramel, caramel, um, Love it. caramel covered in brittle is, is kind of really interesting. And I think, you know, segueing from that into what we're going to try next, another yeah, yeah. really interesting flavor profile. And, and for those of you who are following along, I know many of you went out and you bought your, your bog oak cask and you're, you're asking is it time to pour it? Yeah, by all means, pour that into your glass. But before we move on to that, um, and I don't often do this, but I'll put this out there. Go out and buy this. Like, find this barrel-proof West Cork. Um, this is 
you're, you're probably going to find it for 40 or 50 bucks, 45 bucks, 62% alcohol. Don't drink it as your first whiskey of the night, but have it two or three whiskeys in and then see how you like it. But I don't think, I, I, I 100% believe what people told me and I now um, realize they were telling me, uh, they were giving me good advice earlier on, which is that this is the best value Irish whiskey they've had this year. Um, astonishing. And is this widely available, Alex, or is it more specialty? No, it's pretty widely available. And again, right, like if anyone is having uh, an, a, any difficulty in where they are living, uh, finding any of this stuff, I'm an open book. Um, so, you know, if, if you don't necessarily see me pop up, you know, I'm sure Barry will post this afterwards. My contact information will be in there. Uh, you know, you can send me a message and if not, track me down through Barry and, um, you know, we can absolutely help you find it. And if if you don't find it, then I'll put it on my list of places like Ohio uh, to try and get some of that product into the state. Alex was so quick today when somebody in Washington um, asked about availability and he was in there giving the locations. And I want to see, I'd love to see more. I, I've reached out to so many whiskey brands saying, get into our Facebook group, just engage as a whiskey retailer, a whiskey producer, because look, so many of you went out and bought these whiskeys tonight and he, what a chance we have here to engage with the people representing the brands who can source and share with us where those whiskeys are available. I think um, this is a great time to be an Irish whiskey and a great time to build a bit of community around it. So thanks, Alex, for that. And uh, you heard him. Go, go knock on his door uh, in up there in Massachusetts. Hang out in his yard and uh, don't leave until he either gives you a sample or directions to the nearest barrel-proof retailer. We don't like lingering, okay? You can resonate <laughs> in my backyard for about five to ten minutes, but that, that will be the extent of that. Um, no, and happy joy as well. Does, does Joy work for the brand? Please reach out to Alex or uh, I yeah. tell her. One of my so she's more than happy to help anywhere. Hi, Joy. Great. Nice to meet you, Joy. Uh, how did Joy get out of not being on the lock tonight? She she avoided being on camera. Um, if she's not careful, we'll send her a link and, and, and pull her on screen as well. <laughs> All righty. So, um, should we move on to the next one? I think we should. I think we should. We've given the okay. people, the people are in for a, a nice long lock-in tonight too. They, uh, <laughs> they, they, they got the entertainment portion of, of the beginning, and now we're we're diving into some actual tasting of some more whiskeys. And for those of you who just joined and who missed the passionate um, proselytization of Irish whiskey earlier. Um, Maybe we'll have another screaming match later. Maybe Alex and I will get very emotional and start screaming about how much we love Ireland and Irish whiskey. Yeah, it's great, right? Like, it, if we can harness that passion and have everyone have that same passion about Irish whiskey, yeah, I mean, the world is a better place. What's not to love? I mean, nobody's, nobody's forcing us to do anything. Instead, they're presenting us with opportunities to engage and have some fun and try new things. I cannot for the life of me understand the detractors from such an opportunity. But anyway, um, so I don't think I've seen a bottle that looks like this for quite a while. A dark brown bottle of Irish whiskey. What have we got here, Alex? Uh, so this is one of the two whiskeys that we have, you know, available right now in this Glen Gareth series um, coming from West Cork. So uh, obviously named for the Glen Gareth forest that is outside of Skibbereen. Um, when we think about what these whiskeys are, is is this is an entirely different kind of concept, I guess you could say, about how to go about making your whiskey. Now, when we, uh, the whiskeys themselves are single malts. So let's start there, 100% um, malted barley. Uh, again, initial maturation we're seeing in those first fill bourbon casks. But where it gets, uh, kind of mad scientist-esque, if you will. Uh, John and the team decided that they wanted to kind of build a unique way of charring casks. Now, when we think about charring casks, right, that is an interesting nose. That probably uh, <laughs> smells a little bit different. Um, when you think about charring casks, right, you think about how you go about it, it's or it's some other, you know, neutral fuel. Now, what if you were able to impart flavor in that charring process, right? So rather than 
malting your barley differently. Um, yeah, it, it is this crude, almost turbine looking uh, contraption that we are using to use natural fuel sources in order to char these casks. So with the two that you know you see to my left, whether it's the bog oak or whether it's the peated, and tonight we're talking bog oak, um, we're using fallen oak uh, that we're sourcing from the Glengarra Forest, downed in, in bogs and preserved really in these bogs. Now what happens when the oak is preserved in these bogs is the tannins almost preserve this wood that's down there. So I think you're gonna see, it translates to the whiskey itself, maybe an increased acidity almost. Um, maybe a, a little bit of like an astringency, but in a really pleasant way with this bog oak. And of course there's gonna be a little bit more of a, a toast on it. Um, so, you know, in my immediate thought, and I think it's always nice, keeping an open mind anytime you're talking about whiskey is, okay, well like, you know, does this make a difference? What What is the actual difference that this is going to make on my overall whiskey? And one of the questions that I asked John when we started talking about, okay, how much does it change um, things? We talked about the, the peated cask, right? And traditionally how you'd go about measuring your your smokiness in your whiskey would be in your phenol content, right? So uh, you look to scotch whiskeys, you see a phenol content from, you know, 20 to 40 phenol parts per million. Um, when you look at what we did with the peat charred cask, we're doing no malting with peat, right? So the peat charred cask, there's no malting with peat but there's actually traceable phenols that are in the cask itself. So with the peat charred cask, we see that liquid around two phenol parts per million. So what that tells me is that we are able to extract flavor from these natural resources that we're using to char the cask. So with the bog oak, for me, it delivers much more, uh, I think baking spice, but again, with that acidity, it's almost like a, uh, you know, a mold cider, but taking into a, a bite into a Granny Smith apple yeah, with yeah, that yeah. mold cider yeah. flavor profile. Alex, before we go on to tasting this property, I wonder, um, your your connection has started to get a little bit spotty and, and you're breaking up a little bit. I wonder, could we get you to log off and log back on? And maybe if there's anything on your computer that's that's on there, just close as much down any apps or anything that's running and then and then come back into us would you mind doing that yep i'll be right back awesome um this happens every now and again just with the connections but no issue we'll, we'll keep talking west cork while you're doing that um right so we're we're on to west cork bog oak charred cask for those of you who are sipping along alex will just shut down some of his apps there and come back in um i still have some of my uh barrel proof that i'll come back to but if i downed this barrel proof before i moved on to the next one this uh, lock-in would be conducted horizontally and me lying on the floor, afraid I was gonna fall off the floor. But it's unbelievable that barrel proof, really. I don't think I've come across a better value Irish whiskey in a long time. I'm gonna share this again. I can't speak highly enough of this. Barrel proof, West Cork, 62%. It'll put hairs on your knuckles and on your palms and everything in between. And if you have hairs, it'll curl them. And if you want curled hairs, that's your whiskey. As simple as that. Um, so Alex was mentioning these two different uh, charrings here. You've got your bog oak chard, and you've got your peat chard casks. So we're gonna sample the bog oak chard, and then we may, sure who knows, we might even crack into the peat chard as well. You never know. Uh, and thanks to all of you who are drinking along. And uh, here comes Alex back in there now. I think, uh, there he is. Good to go. Yep, good stuff. On we go. Your Fair video play. looks much Appreciate more that. fluid. Um, so yeah, like, like we were saying, I think the flavor profile here you're, you see more baking spices and that bog oak is delivering that. So, you know, we look around what's happening in the rest of, of Irish whiskey and a lot of people are maturing in Irish oak. Now, what we're seeing is using that Irish oak as a fuel source uh, to char those casks. So uh, delivering a different flavor profile, um, but still kind of staying in that same vein of, again, here using 100% Irish grains supporting the the town and surrounding town of Skibbereen um, and 
trying to keep everything we possibly can as focused on that West Cork area as possible. What are you getting on the nose there, Barry? Moss, peat, kind of damp, damp sweetness. Um, there's a, a like a ferns, like these ferns that grow in the forest, and then I got that that candy from the um, the barrel proof seems to be creeping through as well. There's that sweetness again, the caramelized sugar coming through as well. And that's just on the nose. I haven't sam I haven't tasted it yet though. It is it, again, this is I mean we you showed the picture uh, just a little while ago, but uh, this is a very unique process. We are the only people who are doing this um, in the world in terms of as far as I know, using a different fuel source to char the inside of these casks um, and, and really celebrating that fuel source because again, it, it's delivering completely different flavor profile and compounds to what it eventually goes into being our whiskey as we mature and rest in these casks. But this is something that, you know, I know that John has experimented with other woods with, and, you know, the Glen Gareth series looks this fashion for now, you know, there's a lot of different trees. There's a lot of different woods that we could use out there in the world. So whether it will expand to something else, you know, we're hoping it does because I think that both of these whiskeys are something that uh, are really exciting and very, very different. I'm after getting my glasses mixed up here and I'm 65 whiskeys in. I need to pour this again. <laughs> <laughs> I, put, I put them down and I'm after playing that, that magic trick of which, which glass is the ball under, you know? That's a dangerous game to play, especially when I'm, there's I'm, a 62% 62, 62 right? whiskey sitting on the table somewhere. I'm convinced I have it right, but for because we have enough to pour, I'm going to pour again just to be yeah, safe. Yeah, we'll revisit. <laughs> Cheapers. And I mean, here you're looking at 43% alcohol, right? So it, it is a, a tad bit higher, but I mean, for, for you, a great step down uh, from 62% down to the 43%. Oh, sure. I'll be, uh, th this will be a breakfast whiskey after the after the barrel proof. This will be your, your cornflakes oh, sure. whiskey. I'm okay, sure, so... But to, to, to recap and to help me understand it and my, my slow brain at this time of the night, you've you've taken this bog oak and you have used this as the fuel to char the inside of the casks that then yep. imparts the phenols, the flavors that come from that bog oak are perhaps lightly and more fragrantly attached then to the inside of the cask. And then that flavor is ultimately imparted into the whiskey. Absolutely. Right. So when we think about, I mean, let's just talk about some other, you know, steps in producing whiskey. When you think about going about malting your barley, right? It's clearly obvious if you were to dry your barley over a different, not a neutral uh, fuel source, if you're drying your barley over a peat fire, it absorbs that peat smoke. So why couldn't the same concept be applied to a cask? And, I love it. I love it. and, what we're doing is using things outside of, yes, we repeat, and, and you'll see that that's present on the liquid that's in that bottle. But the bog oak is something that everyone's going crazy for Irish oak right now. Why not try and use that flavor profile in something uh, in, in a different kind of direction, a different attack? And I think that that's what we did with this Glengariff edition is you see perhaps some of the elements that are celebrated with Irish oak, uh, for me, I always get a nice strong undertone of chocolate, I think, um, and that was pretty unanimous. Um, and you know, you and I, I think, have, have had a few glasses of the Dargalock series in our day. Um, and I think that that was, that was one of the elements that I found, I think was a chocolate note that I kind of found throughout. Um, here, hmm. You look perplexed. I'm trying to detect. So what I'm getting now is I'm getting some of that same kind of candy sweetness that I've got before. I'm also getting more of the malty, the maltiness is coming through. And it is a creamier whiskey, I think, on the palate than the barrel proof or the bourbon cask. Am I 
lunatic at this time of the night? Am I detecting the wrong things or, or where am I? No, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, in terms of body wise, um, I think that this feels creamier. Um, again, us utilizing and leaning more on those, those youthful bourbon casks. Um, I think that that's where we see that kind of sugar sweetness come through. Um, mm. so, yeah, I mean, you are not wrong. Um, but I think, you know, what we should do is, I know that we said that we were going to talk just bourbon cask and this. I think what we should do is maybe do a little pour of the peat and then come back to the bottom. We'll have to. We'll have to. Yeah, and I think, I think there you can kind of see just the slight difference uh, because the body of the whiskey, right, the, this single malt body is going to be synonymous between the two, right? We're not manipulating the age of the liquid between these two whiskeys. Yeah, yeah. All we're doing is just that finishing cask. What the fuel is that charred that cask is going to be different. Is there more of a spice to this single malt than there would be even to the barrel proof? Is there more of a, a cracked pepper spice to it? I, I think I get that spice and I'm, I'm, that's coming from the bog oak itself. Now I think I get that spice along with some baking spice, maybe a little bit more for me. Um, so like that cracked pepper goes almost in the way of a, um, for me, like a, a, a star anise or like a caraway. I think maybe there's like a slight acidity, um, yeah. but, but a nice peppery, spicy note to it. Let, let, let's try these two side by side because I want to I want to try the difference. And while we're before we pour those, Andrew wants to see the carnage on my table. So let me show. Let me switch cameras <laughs> here. Okay, so here's my other camera. Let's do this. Oh okay, boy, how's that? This is the this is the carnage and. Uh, this is only a quarter of the table, Andrew. So hopefully it gives you some indication of what all the glasses I have to keep up with. But yeah, that's what's uh, that's what's going on on the table there. You know, that's a, that's a nice little spread for a Friday night. It's not the worst. I mean, I got to clear it away pretty fast for a, an early Saturday morning breakfast. You know, to make it feel like I'm actually living in a home, not a not a not a, a tasting room. Well, I mean, you have some breakfast whiskeys on the table, I think, right? We already we established that there's a few bre uh, breakfast whiskeys out there. There certainly are. Now, this right. is. Uh, I'm curious to to hear what you think on the nose of this because I'm going to keep my comments to myself for now. All right. Let me open this. Let me crack this open. Never have so many bottles been opened in one fell swoop. I feel like that's. The lie detector test to turn out the library. I, I'm sure that there's been more bottles open in one fell swoop in one evening. Well, I suppose you're right. <laughs> I suspect you're probably right. Okay, let's pop this one open. All right, so I'm still new to my peated whiskey journey, but this isn't peated malt. Again, this is following your peat, uh, smoking, using peated, using peat as a fuel source, right? Using peat as a fuel source to char the so we're not like we're, you know, when you go to finish a wine cask and do a light toasting, we're not doing that. We're actually charring the inside of the cask. So, you know, when we, again, the, the traceable amounts of phenol in this are about two. So it's very, very uh, delicate. And there light. we go. There we go. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, that's lovely. There's a lovely, sweety smokiness. Oh. And it feels almost lovely. grassy as well. And, and, you know, I think that the smokiness and earthiness of the peat. Now, when you think about this, when you think about what is the Glengarra Forest, now we're dealing with a higher elevation here. So in a peat conversation, if you're using lower lying, more coastal peat, I mean, think about what peat is, right? Peat is decomposing plant matter for the most part. So if you're using something that's lower lying, more coastal, you're going to get those more coastal flavors. So that more earthy, maybe iodine note. Now, when you look to a higher elevation, you're dealing with something that, you know, the flavor profile is going to be, you're dealing with decomposing heather and different plants and trees. So it feels more smoky than it does earthy. I think if that makes sense when we talk about, about the peat influence on this whiskey. Um, so the peat is coming from the Glengarra Forest as well? Correct. And the Bago. So they both the, are sourced from the Glengarra Forest. 
And Glengariff is um, not too far from Skibbereen. It's between Skibbereen and Cork. And there's a, a wonderful um, island there off Glengariff called Garnish, Garnish Island. And it's got like all this amazing, it's got there's just such a unique microclimate around Glengariff and around uh, Skibbereen and Garnish Island. There's plants and trees that grow there that don't grow anywhere else in Ireland. And it's got that wonderful um, Gulf Stream, that warmer jet air coming up um, across yeah. the Atlantic, yeah. which makes for a unique microclimate. And they have those Italian gardens there as well. They do, they do, and palm trees, and and it's yeah, it's it's amazing. I remember so, spending and, a lot of my summers in my childhood there. Oh really? So when we yep. were talking about the gin earlier, right? The the are the gin that we produce at West Cork is Garnish Island gin, and yep. uh, Deirdre Bohane spent a lot of her childhood summers on Garnish Island, so that kind of flavor profile is built almost reminiscent. Uh, uh, of what to protect in Cornish Island itself. Mm. Right? And I think that, oh, that that's is Pete that's for me. Lovely. And I think Pete for a lot of people is a really scary word because yes. it's one of those things where they've tried a heavily peated whiskey and again talking about where that Pete's coming from and it over delivers on that, that earthy iodine mm. note. And oh, this I love is it. just... This is just a little bit of that earthy, smoky note, but adding yeah. on to that sweetness that we see from those bourbon casks that we're using. You know, whenever I've, people have been very kind to in, indulge me and to it, it basically put up with me as I try and taste their whiskeys, especially those in the peated side of things. Like we've had great friends of ours from Sleeve League Distillers and from WD O'Connell as they've introduced me to their peated whiskeys. And I've started to understand it but even at their, some of their whiskies are quite lightly peated, but they are still way more peated than this. And they always talk about the campfire and the bonfire, and I've never got it. I've only gone straight to the iodine in, in their in their whiskies. And as soon as this passed my lips, I was immediately transported to the burning embers of a, of a campfire, the red, white embers of a fire in the most delicate of ways. And it's then immediately giving away to a sweetness this is a lovely introduction to Pete. Lovely. You know what it is? It's like uh, it's like if you've taken your marshmallow and you've put your marshmallow too far into the fire and it, it mm. catches on fire. That toasty, earthy crunch, but then the sweetness after it. Oh, that's lovely. That is a lovely whiskey. And, and so here, I think, because people are more familiar with what that peated flavor profile is. Here, I think, in tasting and talking about this, you can see how it's just the whiskey itself is just kind of kissed by that peat as the fuel source that's charring the barrels. Now, when you think about the bog oak and going back to that, you you see more of the spicy notes in, in the way that you were saying that that peppery, almost, for me, baking spice, maybe slight acidity. Yeah. You can see how it just influences the whiskey a little bit because here, again, when you say peat, people think something that is, you know, the, a whiskey that malt is directly peated, in which case the peat mm -hmm. is very prominent and overtakes the body of the whiskey. Um, and you can see it's just a touch of it. You're just being kissed, kissed by the peat, and then it runs away giggling into the forest because it achieved its goal of making you notice it, and now it's gone. And agreed. I think that it's a perfect bridge for, for that person, you know, your, your friend, comes over and you say the word Pete and they run to the other room uh, and you know we all have people who, who say that it's uh, you know Pete is something that I don't like I'm, I'm anti Pete this is something that you you pull the bottle out and I think that it's that happy medium where it's the introduction it's the the handshake and the smile of, of you know welcome to Pete at whiskey you know I think this the Pete the Pete chard cask to me of the two that have been the Glengariff series here is maybe the more pronounced obvious example of that process where the bog oak is very subtle in its differences and its flavors that are imparted. Whereas um, it's obvious the fennels that are coming through from the peat, they make themselves known. And then, like I said, they disappear, but yeah, it's definitely the more pronounced of the two, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely is. And that's what I'm saying. I think that, I know that we had discussed doing bourbon cask and, and the bog oak tonight, but the peated, because when I say bog oak, people go, well, what the heck is bog oak, 
right? Now, if we talk about peat, you can know what you're looking for. Um, and that's why I said tasting this and going back yeah. to something like the bog oak and revisiting it, you can see the slight difference there. Wow, what a difference when you step back from the peat. It's even sweeter, isn't it? When you move to the, it, the bog oak. It, it feels a little bit sweeter. Um, again, that, that white pepper spicy note, I think comes yeah. through. For me, the, the tip of my tongue, like uh, you know, a little bit of acidity and astringency, the, the tannins, I think show up a little bit. Mm. Um, it is, hmm. it, it's just a really delicate and interesting whiskey. And again, a process unlike what anybody else is doing. That's really interesting now, yeah. It just goes to show that when you can line up a little portfolio of whiskeys and compare and contrast, when you go up and down the the portfolio, you'll start to detect different flavors and different notes. No, and I think it goes huh. back to, you know, I think it goes back to what Mark was saying earlier on the call is, you know, everyone is going to have their own way of going about things and what they want to highlight and what they want to discuss. And, and for him discussing, you know, single farm traceability and terroir, that's his thing. I think for us, um, I think that innovative kind of spirit and mindset of, you know, hey, let's find a more efficient way to build uh, a still. What if we were to start charring casks in a different fashion? Yes. What if we looked at these other these other variables? Um, you know, and again, we're talking about two smaller brands. Uh, you're not going to see West Cork or Waterford on billboards as you're driving into your, your city. Um, I think yeah, that yeah. for us, it's about the whiskey right now and, and how to get the whiskey into your hands and in giving you exciting things like the Glen Gareth series where you might say, I'm not a peat drinker, and then all of a sudden find yourself seeing this introduction and, and kind of diving into it even more. Are these the only two in the Glen Gareth series at the moment? Yes, they are. What's the black cask? <laughs> Going through your box now, are you? Uh, I have the box the beside me. It is your fault for sending me a box of whiskey. What am I going to do when we talk about it and drink it? <laughs> um, so the black cask. It doesn't mean I'm opening it, but I'm just curious. <laughs> I mean, I'll visit it with you. Um, what we're doing with the black cask is we are doing an additional maturation into a double charred cask. So we're bringing a American oak cask up to char level five. Um, now, again, when we look at what that build is, a, a blended style whiskey here. So going back to that wheat and malt component, uh, but similar to what we had seen with the barrel proof. So um, around that two to one ratio, uh, 66% of that pop distilled wheat, and then a third of the malt body there. So this, I mean, it's tough going from a peat to something that's gonna deliver on a different smoke note, because you're gonna kind of see them, I think almost in a similar vein, but this is smoky, not in that earthy smoky way. This might be even a little bit more campfire than what we just had. Really? And that's interesting because if I think about like a double charred bourbon cask, I think we'll all be most familiar with like Jameson Black Barrel, twice charred, right? And so this yeah. is this isn't is this twice charred or is it double charred in the sense of the depthness of the char, the the crocodile alligator char? What have we? Is that? It is going in the way of an alligator char. So you're okay. seeing that deeper char. It delivers further on that flavor profile, and it, it's prominent. Um, I think that. This interacting with that wheat distillate, um, this comes across as you can really taste that deeper char on the barrel itself. You're running out of glassware? I, yeah, I'm i unwrapping new glassware here. I've gone through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight glasses tonight, and <laughs> I'm looking over there what's left. I've got wine glasses, Irish coffee glasses, and then I've got <laughs> a wrapped to a glass. I've unwrapped it. <laughs> I have to keep a track of what's what here now. I have to put the bottles in front of the glasses. 
So I know what I'm Well, this one, uh, this one you will be able to pick out of the lineup. And I think, you know, again, in, in this portfolio, um, from a price point, you're looking at under $40 a bottle. I think that this makes an excellent Irish coffee. Uh, this is probably one of my Irish coffee drinkers uh, because I think it builds on that that smokiness, the the toffee, the caramel, but it also delivers on that roasted element that you get from your, your coffee as well. Are, are these whiskeys going to start getting more expensive now that West Cork have to pay your uh, exorbitant salary? <laughs> uh, no, they will not. Uh, we are not. Uh, we're not in that mindset at all. I think right now what we want to do is we, we want people to open up as many of these bottles as possible. I think that this is a fun thing to do when, you know, we've talked about how you and I met in my past life. You can go and buy all of these bottles for less than one of the bottles for some of the brands that I've worked for in the past, right? This is a really affordable range to, we've spent an hour plus hour and a half maybe with the guest tonight. Like, you can walk your friends through this now and start talking about the different flavor profiles and what you see coming from each of the different whiskeys. Um, you know, I think I'm that going it, to share it which, you that opportunity. Well, you, you've been very generous in sharing some of these ex amazing examples of West Cork. I'm not going to, I'll, I'll, Alex can be the one if he wants to share where he was before. But all I'll say is that Alex and I may have met uh, in a previous life working for some whiskeys that may have been over my shelf there. Uh, are over my shoulder uh, on the shelf there, which I think take up most of my shelves there. <laughs> they do. Uh, no, I, I, you know, we met when, actually we met um, launching Red Breast Small Batch in Massachusetts, the original Small Batch, the 14 year old that we had just in Massachusetts and Northern California, um, which was a fun filled little weekend. It was a good time. We had a good time. It was a good time. <laughs> um, um, I think, you know, like I said, here, giving a lot of these different whiskeys, which are night and day different from one another. Um, and the availability to go out and not spend your last dollar to acquire all of them is something that we really take pride in at West Corp. The value is incredible. Like you, it has to be said, the the price point. And now this um, black cask, completely different, isn't it? To all of the Absolutely. other whiskeys, completely different. Like I said, the smoke coming from Pete, you'd think that, you know, the smoke is somewhat synonymous, but it's much drier. Um, you know, where I, I feel like the, the peat was kind of maybe a little bit more earthy and full. I think that this is a much drier, toastier smoke. I don't get any smoke at all from it, to be honest. Really? No, I'm not getting anything. But if you looked at the line of a whiskey as I had before me, it's just a wonder I'm even vertical, but... <laughs> I get more of um. It's almost like there's a there's a very short front to the whiskey, but the back of the tongue, the sides of the tongue, it start a flavor starts to appear, but there's it's it's in no way like straight in your face up front. It's kind of subtle flavors. There's a wood spice subtlety to it. Absolutely. Huh. People know, I often hear people asking if, if a Jameson black barrel is twice charred, does that mean it's smoky? And of course there's no smoke or there's no peat or, or any of those elements that come through. And, and here, I wonder if it's more of that kind of like caramelization is coming through. Um, it's dry in the finish, isn't it? It, it feels, it does feel very dry. Now I'm wondering if that's, you know, because we're going from what was that malt to a little bit more of that wheat in this distal ear. Um, and that's why it may, it might feel a bit drier. There's a note in there. I cannot put my finger on. I cannot for the life of me identify it. It's not smoke. It's not caramel. It's familiar, like it's on the tip of my tongue, and I can't, I can't get to it. What is that note? It's almost like a, um, uh, again, I think the sugary sweetness comes through, right? It's almost in that yeah. dessert direction, um, whether it is, 
like praline or, or, or something along those lines? Do you know what it is now? It's almost a, um, a pine, a pine slash mahogany note. That's, okay. that's coming out of the sugars. Um, and take my tasting notes um, with a grain of salt and they're worth what you paid for them. But, and I'll come back to this tomorrow to, to revisit, but there's a, there's a pine note. Yeah, I, I can see perhaps like where that is. I, I think it, it really is the, the over, it's the wood showing through, right? It is that, that heavily charred wood. Now, I don't necessarily get pine, but I know exactly where. It might be off in the pine. Like it's something along, the, it's what it's what my brain is telling me is there, but geez, it wouldn't be the first time I'm wrong, you know? I, I'm told regularly. <laughs> hmm. It's hard to beat the um, the barrel proof for wow factor of this lineup tonight. It's just an incredible, like it punches you in the face in the best way to say, hey, I'm here. Like you, you cannot avoid me. Like I'm not going away. Like I'm going to stay here. You're going to know I'm here. You're going to witness me and experience me. It's astonishing. Yeah, and I think that there are some, between, between the barrel proof, um, the value that is bourbon cask, and then... You know, whether it's the peated cask or, or the bog oak with the Glen Gareth series, there are just whiskeys here that are drastically different from anything you'd expect uh, from anybody else Agreed. in Ireland. Agreed. Agreed. 100%. Um, I, I'm going to be the first to admit I have not given West Cork the due diligence it has deserved. We've had a couple of, of samples of it on the lock in in the past, but we've never gone this deep into understanding the components and then the diversity of the range. Um, and it's clear to me why there's not more awareness of West Cork. It's because the money that could be spent on marketing is instead not spent on marketing and that saving is passed along and that you can get some of these whiskeys for $22 or the barrel proof for $45 to $55. There's not much value like that out there. And I can see why that's our, sometimes uh, even less. That's our win. Yeah. And sometimes even yeah. less, right? They in certain instances, you you will find those for even lesser price points. So I think Amazing. right now, you know where this is is we want people to open up bottles and experiment, and taste with friends, right? That's what that's what this is all about. This is people getting together to talk about Irish whiskey, and I think that that's what is so exciting about it is the camaraderie of what we can do with our whiskeys and not exclude people because they don't feel like they can afford it or aren't comfortable with spending that amount of money. When are they going to bring you over to West Cork to experience true West Cork hospitality? <laughs> uh, I haven't been true West Cork hospitality. However, I, I have uh, played rings at the Castle Inn. Um, <laughs> I've, I've had a few cocktails at the High Beast, so I've had some Cork hospitality. Uh, but... I'm sure whenever they will allow me in, uh, I will be headed over, and we'll and we'll get uh, we'll make sure when I go over, I'll bring uh, you know we'll bring the computer and I'll just tell John that we need to sit down for an hour or so. And we'll surprise let's do him it. with a little. <laughs> let's do a let's do a lock in live from one of the warehouses in front of um, Barry Chander's single pot still cask of whiskey. <laughs> a surprise lock in. We we just won't tell him it's happening. We'll just open up the computer and, and there we go. Yeah, you just say, John, there's a, I need you in the warehouse at midnight. I can't tell you why. Um, I know it's midnight, but just trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that will go over very well. <laughs> um, but no, you know, we, we look forward to, again, I, I'm making myself available. Anyone has any questions on the distillery, you know, where they can find products, please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, I'm sure this is not the last time we'll be having a conversation uh, no. similar to this and, and hopefully we'll get, you know, John involved. And um, yeah, you know, I, I know once things are back up and running, um, you know, I've talked to, to the lads at the distillery and just, you know, the availability to go there and look and see what we're doing is something that, you know, I asked, I was talking to him and I was like, well, what's the deal with tours at the distillery? How do we go about them? And they were like, well, if you just show up, maybe on a Saturday at the right time, then somebody will walk you through the distillery. 
um, which is great. <laughs> There's no official tour. Like, you, you never know who you're going to get. Um, however, you know, what we want is we want to welcome people in, show them what we're doing, show them how we go about making things like the Glen Gareth and, and, and really introduce them to what the, the look, feel, ethos, the, the terroir, to borrow a word that, you know, was thrown around a lot earlier, is yep. what the terroir is happening at West Cork Distillers, right? Um, what we're doing, why I, we're doing it, and the people we're doing it with. I love the West Cork story, and I've always lamented the fact that we've not been able to get enough access to tell it more and to share it more, and hopefully this is a bridge towards getting more awareness it doesn't you know i mean like we're doing tonight for a few bottles of whiskey that's all it takes you know like we're, we're here we're having the crack and we're having hearing the stories um i you've been part of our um irish whiskey fans of america group i think since the red breast days and you've seen some of the like the incredible engagement that happens in there around irish whiskey and the passion around irish whiskey and i know did you see like when we launched our our own whiskey there last year the story um to the group and it was like we, we generated a bit of buzz and it was really exciting to follow the journey of the story to fruition and get into people's hands. But all this talk of West Cork and now our newfound uh, bridge and access to West Cork, I see a new bottling for our Irish whiskey fans of America group. And I see a West Cork in our future, just throwing it out there. And, and look, we would love to make it happen. Um, and I mean, we will leave your, uh, cask of single pot still untouched. We can find another one that's lying around uh, when we decide to go down that road. But, you know, it, it's something that we would love to have the opportunity to to work with you guys and the Irish Whiskey Fans of America. I, I remember when it, you started the group and where it's come from since then. And, you know, it's funny because I've been having these Irish Whiskey conversations now for a better part of the last decade. And and seeing the community come together and, and all be equally as excited about what it is that we're doing and we're discussing, you know, the, the possibilities are endless in terms of what the future of Irish whiskey looks like uh, and what, you know, we can all do together. I mean, I saw, I, I saw your two off glasses. You've got a good little thing going with this stories and sips and, and Irish whiskey fans of America. And you know what? It, there's a reason. And it's because the whiskeys are exceptional. The stories are exceptional. Yeah. In such a under, it's such an overlooked category for so long. Um, and we are no longer that, right? And Irish whiskey is now coming on the forefront. And, you know, the opportunity to work with a, a brand like West Cork that is not on the forefront right now of what's happening in Irish whiskey but to be able to open these bottles, tell the stories, give people a glimpse into what these liquids are and, and why we're doing things differently and, and what that's yielding, uh, this yeah, is what it's all about. I love it. I, since we launched the story, we, we've had a few brands and a few whiskey companies approach us uh, and a few individuals who own casks that have been matured in different distilleries around Ireland and they would love for us to sell the whiskey and to bottle it up and it to be a Irish Whiskey Fans of America bottling. And I've not yet pulled the trigger on anything because I've not yet found the the right balance of everything. And one of the things that I want to preserve and maintain with our group is that the group is not just a channel for distribution. It's not just a place where whiskey can be sold. It's rather a place where we can have experiences. And you've experienced the Irish crack and you know what that's like. And that's un, it's unmistakable. It's unrepeatable. It's 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 something that we want to bottle. And the closest we've gotten to bottling that is by doing things like the story where we followed the journey. We've gone to the farm, JJ Corey and Claire, and we've, we've just had a, a great time. It's been one of the greatest joys of my life releasing that whiskey. But I want to go on the record right now as saying, I want a West Cork whiskey for our group. And uh, whatever we, we don't have to, nothing has to be said right now, but I'm just going to say, I would love to figure out a way to create an experience about heroing and showcasing West Cork and for us to make something available to our group. And I've not said that about any other distillery publicly, but I'm throwing it out there. We can have more conversations. It may not ever work or, or, or we may not ever be able to, to figure it out, but it would be amazing if we could do it. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, and unofficially, um, you know, we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, you know, I, I think that it's something that we've entertained the idea of, you know, we, we've looked at maybe the opportunity of working with, 
with small batch or single barrel programs and things of that nature. I think that everybody's looking at that as an opportunity and, and why not, right? So if we can, what, what we'll have to do is we'll work in the next couple months and we'll put something together and then hopefully, you know, we'll take a nice little group of some of the Irish whiskey fans of America uh, across the pond and, and bring it together. Let's do it. I love it. I'm all in. Seriously, that would love be it. absolutely amazing. And I can, like, American audience, if you've not been to West Cork, it is what you're expecting Ireland is going to be. It's those, it's the ocean, the green fields, the small towns, the 16 church steeples in every town, and the incredible bars where we'll have real lock-ins, where we're not talking to each other through a screen or a camera. We're hugging each other and telling each other we love each other, even though we only met each other five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Let's let's make that happen. That sounds like a great time to me. Um, that means we have to go to West Cork. It means I've got to go. I mean, you're going to twist my arm, but I mean, Mrs. Stories and Sips, we would love to live in West Cork. Like we have talked about this a number of times, and if we could figure out living in in Skibbereen, we would do it. Uh, it's not off the it's not off the table at some point, but uh, it's just a remarkable place, and I would love more Americans to see it and experience it. For sure, and you know what? I mean, we can talk to John and, and the boys over there and see. You know, maybe we've got a job at the distillery, and you know, you just fit right into the skibbereen fold when you get over there. I'll be a bottler. I'll 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 just brush the floors or sweep the floors. I don't mind. I'm not a proud man. I do whatever it takes. We can do it. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, it seems like from the comments, we've got lots of interest in such a thing. Um, lots of cheers and people saying, yeah, we'd sell out a single barrel pretty quickly. There's no doubt about that. Um, hey, Alex, just say Barry made, okay, Barry made me do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> field trip. Yes. Yeah, lots of interest. Okay, so we'll explore that separately. And um, that's really interesting. Um, Alex, what are you excited about? I know we're in ch strange times in the world at the moment, and we'd love to be physically hanging out with people. But when it comes to Irish whiskey, what gets you excited about the year or two ahead? Um, I think that the next year or two, um, we're looking at what can be next in terms of you know, for the distillery, but I also think that what's kind of happened with the marketplace and, and how people are looking at the whiskeys, I think co what's happened with the pandemic, you know, maybe it's been an equalizer a little bit in terms of if it's not direct marketing dollars that are being spent, I think having these conversations and opening up some bottles, um, as we start rolling back into what you know the new normal might look like um yeah you know we're able to have some conversations that aren't with you know talking to retailers or, or speaking to to buyers accounts you know our conversations aren't necessarily predicated on money right we can go in there and have a conversation and say look we're a small distillery we're using 100 percent irish ingredients we're supporting this entire region of ireland this is our story and and not being pushed out by a larger brand is is something that I think you know we've we've kind of equaled the playing ground uh, because right now nobody really knows what the next couple months look like. So for us and you know myself and Joy uh, and you know the team at MS Walker who imports the brand uh, into the United States, what it looks like for us is is having the opportunity to have these conversations. You know, right now leading into St. Patrick's Day. This is typically a holiday where, you know, we go in and say, hey, it's, it's Irish whiskey season. You should do it. But now looking at the opportunity and, and maybe not having the same level of attention or, um, you know, investment from some of the larger brands is affording us the opportunity to go in and talk about these whiskeys and discuss why different whiskeys might be the direction to go with your Irish category. Because right. talking to retailers, it's... Um, it's before, you know, five, 10 years ago, it was, I have Jameson and I have Bushmills. I don't need any more Irish whiskeys. And now when we go in that every day, the real estate of the Irish whiskey category is growing. And I think that that's what excites me is, is what's on the horizon. Who's going to be doing something new and different. Yeah. What are they going to be doing? And uh, for me, the next year or two, 
I think that that's what really excites me, uh, you know, kind of about the category and about, you know, what we're going to be doing at West Court. I'd love to see more brands. I think this, this pandemic has introduced more brands to, well, by, by, not by choice, but they've been forced into reimagining how they can get in front of consumers and get in front of people and online and events like this and, and whiskey groups and, and Zooms and all kinds of things have opened up new markets. I'd love to see more brands eliminating conversation about the finest barley and the finest oak casks and instead saying, you know, we built this thing in West Cork. It's actually kind of amazing. Um, we built it by hand. We'd love you to see it. Um, and we're going to do a virtual tour or we're going to bring you there. If, if more and more brands did that, it's going to build such connection, such community, such urgency and excitement to get there for people to want to go and see it themselves. And I'm hoping, I think that's a, that would be a huge opportunity for West Cork is, you know, now through the likes of yourself and just being able to, even though they're, they're, they're shy and understandably so gentlemen that run the business, just could we see the people and could we connect a little bit more? Because if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's, we're missing connection and we're craving it and whiskey companies have a chance to bring us closer to them, even virtually for the moment. Yeah. And I think that um, there's a huge opportunity with that. And I, I think that for so long, you know, smaller distilleries perhaps didn't realize that that's exactly what people wanted to see. Right. Like yeah. before the Irish whiskey fans of America, did we know that there was that many people out there who were right nuts about Irish whiskey like we are, um, you know, not necessarily. So was, was it a priority to bring in a videographer to be able to do a video tour before? No. Um, yeah. Is it now? Absolutely. Right. Like we, these are things that we need to make available because a, no one's traveling to the distillery and seeing what we're doing currently. Yeah. And, and apart from that, not everyone has the means to do it, right? If you have the means to go in and buy a bottle of bourbon cask for $25 or $22, you should be able to see where we're producing that, even if you can't afford the plane ticket to go see it being done. So absolutely, um, you know, opening up what, what the world at West Cork looks like to people who cannot go to West Cork is something that I think we are looking at doing uh, going forward. Count this group in. Count me in. <laughs> I want to be. I, I want to help, and uh, we'll connect separately and offline and independently of having sixteen whiskeys consumed tonight. And that's that's just me. But um, I'm really excited about what's happening in West Cork. Um, there's a certain amount of pride as well. Look, I'm, I grew up in Cork, and I look at the likes of John O'Connell, and I admire their their quiet efforts. And their, their, their Irish efforts, which is, we're not going to tell people what we're doing. We're just going to do it. And we let you be the judge of if you like it or not. And um, I think there's an element of that to what Waterford are doing. I think we might argue that Mark Rainey is far more outspoken and passionate and willing to wear his heart on his sleeve than John O'Connell might be. But at the same time, there's the same approach of, listen, we're kind of just doing a thing here. We hope you like it. And if you don't, would you just kindly move on and leave space for those who are interested? Everyone's got their own style. And, you know, as we discussed, it, I don't see the opportunity for making whiskey the same way that somebody else makes whiskey. Everybody should have their own fingerprint on what it is that they feel is important and how they want to go about that. And, yes. and that's what I think that we are doing. That's what Mark's doing. There's room for all of us, right? Rising tides raise all ships. Um, I think that it, it is just going about showcasing and talking about what you want to discuss you know for us um being able to open up a few of these bottles with friends and you know not be scared to check your bank account the next day that's a great avenue for us are we talking about single species of barley no we're not talking about single species of barley but we recognize that we're growing some of the finest grains in the world in ireland and using exclusively those these are things that are important to the brand itself um and, and everyone has their own way of saying it, but I think that we're all saying, you know, the same thing and saying that, you know, Irish whiskey is, is here to stay and we've got some cool things coming. Well, I think that's the theme for tonight is that sense of place. Waterford is focusing on the southeast of Ireland and the barley. West Cork is focusing on the southwest and Glengariff and, uh, and the like. And what a duo of distilleries to be celebrated and... Please, if you cannot understand what's happening here in these two distilleries 
ask questions and try and find out more. And if at that stage you still don't enjoy them, that's perfectly acceptable. But there's so much to be proud of. And I'm a, a proud Corkonian raising a glass tonight to West Cork because I uh, love what you're all doing and I want to see more of it and would love to be more involved. Two winners tonight, the Glen Gareth, um, Pete, the Pete Chard cask and the Barrel Proof. Amazing, amazing flavours. Oh, stunning. Two winners. There we go. Go out and buy them. Fast. <laughs> now, um, Alex, when you were toasting people in bars around Boston and Massachusetts in former uh, in-person times, would you have had a particular toast or a something that you would have uh, shared to get people to in, to kick off their night? Was there a, a toast that was an Alex toast? I, I didn't have a particular toast. I did not. I, I always wish that I did have a particular toast. Um, but my thing, I think, would be when I do toast, if we're going out with friends, um, I always like to, you know, maybe buy the first whiskey that I, I will buy is something that they are not expecting. Um, you know, I, I think that doing something completely different and, and something special. And I think that, you know, far too often do we kind of hold bottles for uh, a rainy day and we reserve what, what we determine is like, Oh, I, I don't want to drink this bottle because it's too nice of a bottle. Um, yeah. When I have my friends over, uh, you know, before we go out to dinner or whatever it might be, you know, what we'll do is we'll open up those bottles. Cause I don't think that, I think that you don't realize how few of those opportunities that you're going to have and opening up bottles that you are reserving for some rainy day open them up tomorrow. There's always going to be other bottles that are just as exciting. Um, but you know, the, the times with friends, and, the times with friends and family are, are few and far in between, especially right now. Um, so opening up something special and, and having a conversation is more of my toast. I love it. You, you can't take the whiskey with you and uh, you might as well drink it and share it. Absolutely. If you were here now in San Diego, I'd be sharing whatever's in my cupboard behind me, I'd be opening up and saying, have at it. Here's a few sample bottles. Take whatever you want. <laughs> Sharing is caring. <laughs> I, I do that um, often as well. <laughs> it's always nice to we, find some of the bottles that you love at your friend's house the next time you go over and visit. Well, I'm going to take a video of my shelves tomorrow and send it to you and ask you what you would like from my shelves and, and I'll make sure you get a, a, a proper delivery of uh, any samples of anything that's on my shelf. I appreciate that. And you know what? You won't even need to send them. I'll just pick them up the next time I'm, I'm in Southern California. Deal, deal. Um, yeah. One of the um, traditions on our lock-in, which typically falls to me, but is always asked of our guests and is always very much appreciated, but in no way mandated, is at the end of the night, the guests are typically asked, have they a song? And uh, this is the most awkward and embarrassing moment of the night for most people because rarely have they prepared a song, but we ask them anyway. And it's not about vocal ability or singing prowess, but rather have you an old verse of something that you like that you would, after a few drinks, regularly throw out there? And I'm just putting it out there that the floor is open if you're interested. Uh, I would say that I don't, and I am not known to frequent the karaoke stage. But I will say with that whimsical cork accent that you have, I think that you can take the take the lead on this one. Such a chancer, such a, a deflector and a chancer. Uh, I detect uh, diplomacy at the highest degree there of uh, deflection. Um, <laughs> Stacy's lingering for a tune. She's not going anywhere. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I, I've never been the biggest singer in the world. Uh, Joy, oh, Joy wants to sing. Joy. Is Joy a singer? I, I guess she is. Joy, do you want to come on and sing a song? I'll see. We, see if we I can, can get you on in about, in about 30 seconds. I'll send her the link. Send her the, um, the link I sent yeah. you, Alex, the guest link. And um, Joy, come on and give us some joy. Let's go back. God forbid the... Um, the um, Obligation would fall to me at this this late at night. 
I don't know. I think I feel like you have a good voice. Look, people are screaming for joy. Look, Stacy can't uh, hold back the excitement. I've sent is it this, over. Ed wants to know if this is the longest lock-in ever. Yeah, we've actually broken records here, Alex. We're now into three and a half hours of a lock-in. Um, <laughs> People are people are convinced that there's some kind of um, toilet device underneath my table um, for these three and a half hour lock-ins. Well, they saw so your actually, side table. I'm built like a camel. If that helps anybody, I have two humps, and um, so we're good for we're good for at least four hours. No. <laughs> well, I I did my joy. Um, I'm not sure if she is in quite yet. I'll keep an eye here now. Um, but that would be a remarkable achievement if we can... Uh, oh, yeah, now Stacy says we're not even close to the longest. Really? I've lost track. Do we do a longer one than three and a half hours? Dear Mitt says I have no pants on me. How dare you? <laughs> well, well, the thing is, is had I, had I waited, we could have let Mark go for at least another half hour. Well, you know, I knew... I, I know I can talk to Mark for six or seven hours. And I know that the commentary, even in the comments alone, will be enough to give us feed for, for for the debate um but i wanted to balance out the night i didn't want to um take too much of his time and i, I do want to have him back again because i think there's a lot to talk about but just like i want to have you back again because i think we'll do more as well um absolutely no i it, i mean his passion is unmatched unreal isn't it joy is going to save my hide i'm not a singer we need to bring in the big guns Joy, you can't make comments like if you'd only tagged me, I'd have come on and sing and not come on and sing once we actually tag you. So that's just a, a, we're just going to throw it out there. Um, Stacy says we cleared four hours when Donna was on the first time. All right. So for those of you that are still here, I know that you are the diehards, the uh, as I often refer to you as um, the, the people who go to a funeral just to make sure that the, uh, the person is dead. Uh, you are the people who are. You're, you, you stick it out. You want to make sure you see everything and you want to confirm for yourselves. I can now let you in on a secret. I have the next three lock-ins already organized. I've never been so organized in my life. Normally I'm scrambling. But next week we're going to have the, the women of Bushmills. Um, two women are going to come on from Bushmills who represent um, blending and brand ambassadorial skills at Bushmills. We'll be sharing more of their details. Alex and Lauren will be joining us from Bushmills Distillery. We'll be drinking the Sexton and a bunch of uh, the new releases from Bushmills. Next week after that, Donna is back, and Donna's going to co-host with us, and that's March 12th, if I remember correctly, and that is a pre-St. Patrick's Day night, and we're going to do a session with a Guinness ambassador as well. We're going to bring on a, a Californian Guinness rep who's going to drink Guinness with us. We'll have Irish whiskeys, and we'll probably have 10 or 12 different guests that'll rotate in and out. Donna and I are going to host that, and then March 19th is our two stacks Irish whiskey, drams in a can, uh, Irish whiskey in a can night. And we have our two stacks whiskey. We'll be sipping that night. So just to let you know. Uh, so those are the next three lock-ins. And I actually have the three following lock-ins 50% organized. So we're almost six lock-ins organized, which is world-class organization, which has never happened before. Um, That's incredible. So yeah. It's a month and a half. Yeah. We're, uh, <laughs> we're ahead of ourselves for a change. Um, we're, we're so ahead of ourselves that, uh, yeah, we, we get up half an hour before we go to bed. Joy has disappeared. <laughs> Joy has run into the hills screaming. They caught me. They called my bluff. Yeah, she she uh, she just said she can't do it. She we did call her bluff. That's what we have to do. You got to call people's bluff. Uh, we are extending so, the offer at any time to join in for Nell's song. Joy, you'd be welcome anytime, anytime. Um, so that means Barry, you're going to have to lead us with the song to to wrap it up. Uh, Joy is thinking that this is an excuse, that that is a sufficient excuse, that she's on her phone and in her bed. We've had many worse renditions of songs from more spurious of locations than somebody's bed, um, but we, we let you off the hook tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get her on the next time. Um, we will, we will. Next next visit to West Cork will include Joy. Uh, Dearmid wants to hear Sing the Banks. The Banks is a famous song from Cork, The Banks of My Own Lovely Lee. Because I might, I might do a few verses now, will I? The banks. This is a long time since I sang that. Banks of my own lovely Lee. Let me see what we've got here. Uh, 
Um, so Alex, you are you are declining the uh, kind invitation to sing a song. You're instead deflecting and deferring. I'm going to deflect okay. and defer on this one. I think it's for right. it's for the best of everyone who's still here. <laughs> Joy promises she'll she'll prepare something for the next one. Um, we've had some pretty um, eclectic uh, songs from wet, wet, wet to uh, old Irish ballads. So there's nothing off off limits here. It's a bit of a free for all. It is a lock in at the end of a night. A song is encouraged. Like and there's no criticisms of any abilities whatsoever. John if asks that's if, you trying, if that's you trying to get me to sing. It's not working. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying in every subliminal way, but clearly it's not working. Maybe maybe when we do it in person, um, we'll sing a song. Nah. Now that is a different, that's a different occasion. When we get the proper lock in, in a pub in West Cork, different story. <laughs> right. So I'll give a verse or two of a famous Cork song. Uh, uh, Dick Forbes is the man who wrote it. Sean O'Shea is a Cork singer who has made this very famous. Uh, it's called The Banks of My Own Lovely Lee. And the, the River Lee is the river that runs through Cork City and out into Cork Harbour. And that's the, if you're in Cork City and you're standing on any of the bridges, you're looking down at the River Lee, and it's um, one of the longest rivers. I think the second longest river in Ireland or England after the River Shannon. And um, yeah, a lot of stories to go, with that, to go with that river, and there's a song to go with it too. So I haven't sang this in a long time, and I've got some of the lyrics up here that are organized in a funny way, but I'll give it a, I'll give it a blast, as they'd say in West Cork. I'll give it a blast. The banks of my own lovely Lee. How oft do my thoughts in their fancy take flight to the home of my childhood away, to the days when each patriot's vision seemed bright, ere I dreamed that those joys should decay, when my heart was as light as the wild winds that blow, down the mart I through each elm tree, where I sported and played neath each green leafy shade on the banks of my own lovely lee. Then in the springtime of laughter and song can I ever forget the sweet hours with the friends of my youth as we rambled along amongst the green mossy banks and wildflowers. Then too, when the evening sun sinking to rest sheds its golden light over the sea, it's the maid with her lover, the wild daisies pressed, on the banks of my own lovely lee. Oh, the maid with her lover, the wild daisies pressed on the banks of my own lovely lee. Woo! Up the banks, up Cork, you! And you wonder why no one wants to sing with you. That was spectacular. <laughs> Now you stop. Bit of crack. <laughs> no, this was great. Um, I had a great time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. Um, no, seriously. Like, you, know, you, you over delivered. Over delivered. Uh, I'm happy everybody enjoyed themselves. I'm happy we were able to introduce them to some new stuff tonight. You and I have plenty to follow up on, um, whether it's what bottle I'm going to raid from your cabinet or, you know, when we're going to make our way over to West Cork. But, um, Thank or you very both. much. Or yeah, or absolutely both. Um, thank you very much for you know the opportunity to join you tonight and talk to all of the you know great people who joined us. It's uh, it's been a great time, and this, is, this I has been great. Greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you sincerely from all of us for for spending your night with us. And you could be anywhere in your home <laughs> you can't be anywhere in boston or massachusetts but you can be anywhere in your home but you've chosen to be in this one room uh, to be with us tonight and uh, and and your 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 kindness in, in helping us understand the west cork uh, portfolio i think we're only scratching the surface of what we'll do together with west cork and you and i can have a chat off offline about it but um 
very excited for for West Cork and what a great night what, what what crack we had and next next time we're all together we'll bring joy in and she'll sing a song as well and we'll have a good old we'll have a good old time but this is brilliant absolutely so thanks alex thanks a million um we'll uh, we'll catch up again soon and uh, everyone sends their best uh, lots of ch claps and cheers in the group scott says thanks for a great night looking forward to some west cork says johnny L lots of orders placed too tonight by the way for online uh, purchase of west cork which is great to see Oh, great. And um, Tyler says, great lock-in. Thanks, Barry, Alex. Sinead, that's it. We're at the end of our night. Some of us have uh, other rooms to go to, to eat or sleep or do something. <laughs> uh, but Alex, listen, Slauncha, thanks a million. Really appreciate Slauncha, it tonight. Thank you. Take we'll care. Talk to you soon, guys. Cheers. Amazing. What a night. Woo, great night. West Cork, Waterford. We have to do something with West Cork. We have to, don't we? Look at all the stories, the Cork story. A pure Cork story. We have to do it. Dave uh, in California, fantastic night. Looking forward to the field trip to Cork. You see, we have to make that happen. We have to make that happen. I think we, we were handed a little teaser tonight, and I hope you're proud of me because I leapt on it, and I took it. By, I took that bull by the horns, and I said, we're going to do something with West Cork. You don't know it yet, even though you're from West Cork. You're representing West Cork. You don't know it, but we're going to do something from West Cork. Um, we'll do it. We'll absolutely do it. Martin Kennedy. All the way over there in Wexford in Ireland. Fair play, he says. Good, good on you, Martin. Thanks for hanging in there till God knows what time it is in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. And fair play to you. Martin, you'll have to come back to us soon as well and talk about all things Bua. Another fantastic lock-in, says Chris. Greg says, love Cork. Can't wait to visit West Cork. I think we're on to something here, lads. Chancing your arm, says Andrew. Of course I'm chancing my arm. How else do we get things done? Didn't I chance my arm to get the story done in record time? And we made a few enemies along the way who, who had uh, maybe perhaps requested uh, access to JJ Curry's portfolio and were hoping to get their own bottles. We leapfrogged ahead of them. And I'm sorry for that, whoever we have offended along the way. But look, we're all in the one boat trying to enjoy a bit of whiskey together. So hopefully we're all friends. Sinead, that's it. That's it. That's the end of the night. Go away home. Go away to a different room. Do something. Um, but I'm going away and having some food and uh, relaxation for the rest of the night. And I'm excited about what we chatted about tonight. Would you do me a favor? Would you share this? If you're still on, press share. Share it on your Facebook profile. Share it in any groups that you're part of. Share this live stream so that others could enjoy the crack we're having here. The more people, the better. Every week we see new people joining in. And uh, that's a remarkable thing. And I'm delighted for it. This is not going away. So I want to see more people here. That's all I ask of you. Like it, share it. Ask a friend to join us. As simple as that. <laughs> Michael has never met a Cork man who's not 100% proud to be from Cork. So what other way is there to be from Cork except 100% proud that you're from Cork, Michael? And if you're from somewhere else and you're not as proud of where you're from as we are in Cork with our fantastic superiority complex, um, maybe you're not trying hard enough and I'd encourage you to be prouder of where you come from. Great crack, says Jason. Slauncha, good night. Thanks for joining. See you next week.